All right, we're going to talk about some um, arguments uh, which take us to the conclusion that God exists, or something like God. Um, in each case, the conclusion is a little bit different. In argument A, the conclusion is that a very powerful, very intelligent uh, creator of our universe must exist, or likely exists. The conclusion of argument B, the cosmologic argument, is that a first cause or a necessary being or um, a first mover of our universe exists. The axiarchic argument, which is the maybe least known of these five arguments, this is the uh, argument that something good exists and is prior to our universe and is the best way of explaining the uh, existence of our universe. The pragmatic argument is, is the conclusion that a uh, god of a kind exists. This god is a god who um, is your best bet if you're thinking practically or pragmatically, e.g., if you want to maximize your chances of a happy eternity, believe in this being. D, this this argument is quite different from the other five. The other the other four uh, arguments A, B, C, and E all are meant to show you that um, the most reasonable belief is, is belief in God, or that we have a good reason to infer that God exists. The pragmatic argument is the, the argument that it's practically to your benefit to believe in this being. The argument doesn't offer any evidence, nothing like evidence that this being exists. Rather, it shows you that if you're in a betting mind and you want to maximize your practical interests, you should, you should get your mind into the habit of believing in, in the deity. Anyway, we'll come to these in turn. We're going to you know, spend the next uh, two or three weeks going through these arguments in a little bit of detail, some more than others, but uh, let's begin with argument A, the argument from design. Heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, though Van Gogh's depiction of the firmament seems rather woozy and swirly and unfirm, but uh, anyway. This is the sky, and it sheweth his handiwork. Uh, look up at especially the night sky and the bejeweled dome, which uh, encloses us and glorifies its maker. This is, I mean, this is the songs of the Bible, not doing philosophical theology exactly, but giving us something in the neighborhood of the argument from design, it's telling you the world around you, in this case, the example being the sky, um, is a kind of declaration or evidence of its maker. Here's St. Paul writing a, a letter to the early Roman church sometime in the first century A.D., for what can be known about God is plain to them, the doubters, because God has shown it to them. God showeth it to them, the doubters. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, invisible though his power and nature are, they've been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they, they now being the doubters, are without excuse. 
God's power is invisible. God's nature is invisible. Is God special that way? Well, I would suggest no. I would suggest that all power is invisible. That's why in comic book panel illustrations, they show you little laser lines or lightning lines coming from the magician's hands to show you power, but the power itself is invisible. Do you see the power of the Olympic sprinter? No, you infer the power from the sprinting. What you see is limbs moving in, in, in tight uh, coordination to get the sprinter from the start line to the 100 meter finish line. If I ask you to point to the power of the sprinter, you'd be um, hard pressed to, uh, to specify it. The power is sort of an abstraction or it's invisible in any case. And we, we observe power always, not just in God's case, we observe power through its effects. And, you know, we could say the same about nature. This is a very vague term, but a thing's nature, a thing's essence, a thing's soul, it's, it's, it's seen through its effects. To, to forget about God, take just uh, the person you know most intimately, you you might say you know their soul but you can't point to their soul rather if i ask you to point to what it is about them you're in contact with you'd have to point to a sort of uh, a little bit reductively a collection of perceptual sensations you receive their voice impingements on your eardrum from their um thorax and larynx and whatever and you observe them and you don't you don't directly contact their soul you contact the effects of their soul their personality is something you infer through its perceived effects things they say gestures they make and god's really not different that way you might just say god's body through which his effects are perceived are the nat capital N nature itself, the universe itself. You can think of the universe being, if not God's body, then uh, the vehicle through which God expresses the world is maybe a little like God's canvas, just like we can't experience Van Gogh the human directly um, anymore, but we can experience um, him through his painting. Uh, same with same with God. If you take an uh, intro to philosophy, you might spend a little bit of time on this skeptical uh, puzzle, the problem of other minds, which we've talked about already. Really, uh, you you don't make direct contact with other people's minds or personalities or souls. You make contact with the putative effects of their personality. And if you want to be skeptical, you could say, well, how do you know they have a soul or a mind. Um, I mean, to put it a little more um, dramatically, you only know your own mind directly. I mean, there's nothing you know more directly. In fact, it's maybe the only thing you know directly. Everything else is inferred, including my mind. I mean, you hear my voice right now, but how do you know there's anything going on inside my head? Maybe I'm just a very sophisticated uh, AI protocol or some kind of sophisticated Rene Descartes. Imagine the passersby on the street below outside his uh, uh, window were uh, wind up mechanisms with trench coats and hats draped over them. Anyway, that's another course. Problem of other minds. Well, the problem of God is 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 analogous. It's uh, we don't perceive God directly, but Paul here is saying, still you're without excuse because you've got lots of evidence of God's effects. Ah, uh, okay. Physical effects of personality from which we infer, if not the mind behind the head of these exalted figures of American history, we infer at least the mind of the artist who hewed their uh, form into uh, um, Rushmore. And, uh, 
I'll let you apply the problem to this picture. All right, and here uh, a short passage from the Quran. Do not see that Allah has made what is in the heavens and what is in the earth subservient to you and made complete to you his favors outwardly and inwardly. Uh, sort of an additional idea here that we didn't see in the passage from Paul, that the world God has made is not just pretty, like the stars in the sky, uh, but it's uh, for you. It's um, if you really think about things in your environment, maybe things much humbler than the than the heavenly bodies, you, you'll uh, find traces of not just a craft person, but a caretaker, a powerful being who's arranged your environment for you, to feed you and uh, nurture you and please you. Here's a lovely depiction of Eden. I guess that's Adam. I don't know where Eve is. Oh, there's, that's Eve. Yeah, very tiny. There's Eve crouched down. Maybe they're pointing up at the heavens and conducting history's first argument from design. Though, of course, they wouldn't have needed the argument from design. We argue about God and God's absence, but when God is present, as he was to Adam and Eve in the early days, uh, there's no need to do theology. Theology is something for a fallen people who have been uh, divorced from direct contact with their divine source. Uh, so we argue about God and God's absence, and of course, we don't argue about God in God's presence. And we're told that God would walk in the in the evening with Adam through the Garden of Eden. So they had a very intimate contact. Though I guess even then Adam could have performed the problem of other minds on the God he was talking to and walking with. He could have thought at least inwardly, well, how do I know that God isn't just a sophisticated wind-up AI mechanism? That was the world's first Black Mirror episode. Argument from design to the conclusion there's a designer. All arguments go from premises to a conclusion. Um, <clears throat> this argument goes way back. Uh, we see versions of it in the passages we just looked at from, um, from scripture. And... Uh, the more uh, explicit philosophical attempt to, to derive a, a designer, uh, I, I gather we can find versions of going back to the ancient Greeks, maybe over 2,000 years ago. Uh, we'll start by talking about maybe the most famous version of the argument from the modern era. This is uh, Paley's version of the argument from design, circa 1800 couple hundred years old, this this argument. Paley said, imagine you're walking through a deserted area, a natural area, I think he said a heath, uh, strolling through the heath where no man had been. And you came across this in your path. Paley says, even if you'd never seen one of these before, you'd very quickly infer that somebody made this, somebody intelligent and uh, competent made this. This, this, what we call a pocket watch, it's very different from a just a misshapen, similar-sized stone you might encounter in your path. Um, the stone is disordered enough that we're not logically compelled to, to the conclusion that somebody made it. But this has exhibits so much order. Even before you figure out what it's for, you can see there's there's an arrangement of parts here for some purpose, and that implies a uh, orderer somebody who has purpose. So this is, of course, a metaphor for the universe. Paley says, aha, if you agree with me about the watch, then you must more so agree that this great stop pocket watch uh, you've stumbled upon, called the universe, in fact, you've more than stumbled upon it, you've um, found yourself in it. <clears throat> And because it's so big and because it's so pervasive, because it's the water you swim in, you don't stop to think about it maybe in the way that you would this watch. But really, if you do stop to think about it, the universe demands more than the watch does. Um, 
the conclusion that somebody made it. It's more ordered. It's more magnificent. So from the watch, you might infer a very clever human, some Swiss artisan. From the universe, you've got to infer something superhuman, something powerful and smart enough to have made, you know, the thing that Van Gogh painted. So Pegley's watch is the shorthand for this modern argument from design. Here are some classic objections to the argument. We'll look at lots of objections in this course to arguments. Uh, we'll often look at an argument like we just did and then, and then consider objections. A lot of modern philosophy, analytic philosophy proceeds in this, this kind of um, argument objection then response dialectic. So um, some of these objections apply quite specifically uh, to Paley's version or apply best to Paley's version. Some of these objections, I think, would carry over into any version of the argument from design we would look at or will look at. But so these are these are just separate arguments in a list. Uh, objection one, objection two, objection three. The order doesn't really matter, but we'll take them one at a time. So uh, first of all, this, this one comes from David Hume, one of the great uh, Western philosophers and one of the great skeptical minds in the history of philosophy. And a few of the objections to the argument from design uh, we're looking at come from a, a, a work David Hume wrote in the 1700s called uh, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. He set it up like a little philosophical play. Uh, uh, an extended conversation between three characters. And David Hume might have done that. I, I don't know too much about the, the biography or the background, but it, but it's it's not a stretch to think David Hume set up his work that way to shield himself or protect himself personally from any blowback. Um, if someone accused him of being a destructive atheist, he could say, well, I didn't say it. One of my characters in my play said it. And I think he also put off publishing this work until after he died. I th the story is he pressed the work into the hands of his friend, Adam Smith, the, the economist. And Adam Smith uh, passed it off like a hot potato to somebody else. I think in the end, uh, Adam Smith's nephew or someone ended up publishing it. Anyway, we can't conclude much about the nature of the designer from the world. Notice this objection says, okay, well, uh, maybe you can or should infer something pretty powerful and smart um, from the world, but there's just so many questions that remain that you gotta be careful about saying this is an argument for anything like God. First of all, take God singular well, why not infer it's God's? Why go to the monotheistic conclusion right away? Is that just because of cultural um, habits or presumption? In fact, I think Hume suggests, if you're gonna draw an analogy between human uh, production and the production of the world, uh, like the watch, maker of an actual watch and then the maker of the universe well really really uh massive projects like skyscrapers and digital computers are rarely made by or never made by a single maker single human maker they're made by teams there's a division of labor necessarily and uh very specialized skill sets that come into play for different elements of you know building the building the skyscraper and so why not carry that analogy into the explanation of our world? Our world, if you had to bet, would have been made by a team. And so you infer something more like the Greek or a Hindu pantheon of many gods, each specialized. You got a god of the wind and a god of, um, god of the sea, and a god of the sky and a god, a god of the earth and so on. We can't conclude the nature is uh, the, the the designer is good. We can't conclude the designer is still around. 
I mean, maybe this designer made the world 13.8 billion years ago and then, and then tootled off um, and so on. What's the purpose of the universe? R reverse engineer that little pocket watch and uh, you can figure out this is for tracking Earth time. And it, it's the discovery of that purpose which, which supports the view that somebody made it. It has purpose, so somebody with purpose made it. Well, what's the purpose of the universe? You might have your own, your own pet theory or your own uh, deeply held belief about it, but, but what's, what's the evidence you have for that purpose? And you're not allowed to assume that purpose at the beginning of this argument. I mean, if, you've already, if you already know coming into this debate that the universe has a purpose. <laughs> and uh, I mean, why, why are we even having this discussion? It sounds like you already know an awful lot about the, the making of this world. Um, so at the beginning of the argument for design, where we're setting up our premises, you, you, can't, you can't insert a premise about the purpose of the universe without getting close to begging the question of the whole debate. So um, the analogy between things like watches, or I think Hume's example was a house, something made with purpose by a human craftsperson. Um, the analogy between that and the universe really breaks down here. It's a big difference. Here's a very deep objection. You know, this is a Darwinian objection. Um, well, no, you know, actually the next objection is more properly Darwinian. Uh, Dawkins is a Darwinian and uh, his motivate, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to speculate as about his motivation, but yeah, this is not a Darwinian objection specifically. This is, this is a very deep objection to the argument that anyone can make if they think about it. Uh, maybe this is the, I, I think this is the, the objection to the, to the argument from design. I mean, this is the one that a lot of, theological ships will crash on. Um, the argument displaces the problem of design. What's the problem of design? The problem of design is just the intellectual problem of explaining the order we observe in our universe. So we all come to this discussion agreed, hopefully, that yeah, our universe exhibits quite a bit of order. It's not chaos. And the problem is explaining this, right? So we begin this debate, this discussion in agreement that there's something that needs to be explained. And that's the problem. And Dawkins here is saying, and I'm not sure if he's the originator of this argument, but he articulates it very, very lucidly in a book he published uh, called The Blind Watchmaker. And Here's God making Adam his creative touch, infusing humanity with life and order. Dawkins is saying, okay, so he started out asking, how did Adam happen? And we say, well, God made Adam. Well, now we can ask the question at another level. Well, well who made this? Where did the, how did that happen? And following the logic of our first explanation, I guess we've got to say, well, I guess uh, super God, your super God, super God made God. And then again, well, who made super God? Well, I guess super, super God made God. The, the deep objection here is by saying, something very ordered and intelligent made our ordered universe, you've just pushed the problem off to another level. You've actually uh, multiplied your problem. Now you've got to explain something even more orderly, more impressive than the world, right? The thing that makes the world is more impressive than the world. God's more impressive than the world. The uh, robotic assembly line and its assemblage of workers at the car plant, at the GM car plant putting out uh, SUVs, is a more impressive mechanism, total mechanism, than the SUV itself. 
and requires much more extensive explanation than, than the SUV. And so um, the argument from design is deeply flawed, according to Dawkins, because it it's on the right track. I mean, uh, Dawkins respected William Paley. I mean, Dawkins is a pretty virulent atheist, uh, but he respects the theist, William Paley, for recognizing the problem of design. Dawkins, of course, disagrees with Paley's answer, but he, he admires Paley for articulating the problem, recognizing that this needs to be explained. And Dawkins just thinks that Darwin gives us the answer uh, some 40 or 50 years after Paley published his argument. So um, the theory of, here's our Darwinian objection from Dawkins and the rest of them. The theory of evolution explains biologic order. Biologic order is just one kind of order in our universe. There's also chemical order and physical order, the order that physics describes. And maybe moving up from biologic, we get into the psychological and social and whatever. But biologic order is super impressive and maybe it's the most impressive order uh, we, ob we observe. And so if, if we can explain it without bringing in a deity, well, we haven't explained the universe as a whole, but we've shown in principle, in theory, you can explain a high degree of order in our environment without referring to some supernatural creator. And according to Dawkins, Darwin gives us through the theory of evolution a naturalist explanation of biologic order. I mean, if you're wondering how the zebra got its stripes, or you're wondering how we got our opposable thumb, or you're wondering how it is that uh, uh, cells regulate the intake of sodium and potassium or whatever. Um, well, you, we've got now, after Darwin, we've, we've had now for approaching 200 years, a pretty good, maybe often excellent, explanation of that. So here's a response, objection, and then response to objection. So this is an objection, maybe not William Paley himself made, but one can make on behalf of Paley or on behalf of theism, or just in the spirit of argument, taking this objection and saying, hmm, yeah, but evolution itself depends on a deeper order, depends on chemical and physical order. Life, which evolves, I mean, when we talk about evolution, we're talking about the history of life on Earth initially, and maybe um, um, exo, exo biologically eventually, but um, life is about four billion years old, almost as old as Earth itself. But before life, in our current picture, there was a high degree of chemical and physical order in the universe already, and evolution um, um, can't happen without sort of the table of elements already being in place. Even before there's life, there's there's chemical order in the universe. There's the, the laws of physics are in place. And uh, so what we might do after Darwin is say, okay, if you want a direct explanation of the zebra stripes and the cells, um, you know, sort of metabolism, then yeah, use, use Darwin. But if we're asking why are carbon atoms consistent? Why is one just like the next? Why is the speed of light the speed of light? Why is it a constant? Um, why gravity? Doesn't seem like Darwin's theory has anything to say about this. Darwin's theory rather presupposes all of this order and then explains how life happens. So this really pushes us into a, a, a post-Darwinian version of the argument for design. If you want to keep the argument from design alive, you got to stop pointing to things like the mammal eye. William Paley's favorite examples tended to be biological. Writing before Darwin, he was super impressed by things like the 
the eye, the ocular system of the animal, which uh, he, he said was clearly far more impressive than any human optical instrument like a telescope or microscope. So the fine tuning argument is just a version of the argument from design. It's, it's, it's a, I think, a post Darwin version of the argument, which it's the same argument. I don't want there to be any confusion about this. It's, it's an argument from design and it's got the same setup going from observations and our premises about order to the conclusion that there's some kind of designer, capital D designer of it all. But the, the term fine tuning just means we're going to focus in our evidence on order in our universe that's pre-biological or deeper than the biologic. So it's, it, it really relies, I mean, to be impressive, it relies on some 20th century and even more recent findings from physics, mainly physical cosmology and, and physics um, to infer a designer. So these uh, physical constants, I mentioned the speed of light a minute ago um, and the gravity, these are, these are what are called physical constants. Um, these are the um, deep, consistent features of our physical universe. The expansion rate of the universe, I guess this isn't constant, but it's a deep, deep fact about the origin of our universe and the power of the strong nuclear force you might remember from physics. That's one of these fundamental forces in the modern standard model of physics. And it's, it's what binds the parts of the uh, nucleus and the atom together. And it's got a certain power, you know, I can't quantify it for you, but uh, you can look that up in your physics textbooks, but um, it's consistent. And apparently, uh, the experts say, and I think even the atheist experts would agree that if the strong nuclear force was a little weaker or a little stronger, a little, little weaker, or a little, little stronger, um, we would have had a very different universe. We would have had a universe composed entirely of either helium or hydrogen. And assumedly that's not going to be a very good uh, petri dish for something as complex as life. To get life, you need a variety of Lego pieces, you know, to build that that pirate ship out of your Lego set. You can't. You can't it's hard to do with um, just all the same kind of piece. And same with the universe. The expansion rate of the universe. Similarly, if it had been a little, um, I guess this is the initial ex sort of explosive power of the Big Bang. If it had been a little weaker or a little stronger the universe would have either collapsed back upon itself within, you know, nanoseconds of the bang 14 billion years ago, or it would have expanded too fast for any order to, you know, uh, grab hold in that super fast expanding totality. Um, uh, it would have expanded too fast for even gases to form. Gases are a kind of condensing of matter. Um, though we think of it as a dissipating of matter, but um, even gases can be pulled apart. Things are pulling apart too fast and dissipate into true nothing or true ethereal um, insubstantiality. So uh, uh, there's a long list of these. If you, if you Google physical constants, you'll get some lists. Some of the lists will have six items. Some will have 12 items. I've seen some with 39 items. Some of the items you'll see on there uh, really do not belong on there. If you come across a list online of physical constants and it has it has something like the fact that the Earth, this third rock from the sun, is just the right distance from the sun to be hospitable for life as we know it. If someone puts that on a list of physical constants, which is supposed to take you to the conclusion that somebody put put our rock just in that Goldilocks range. That's, I mean, that's a terrible bit of reasoning. It does not belong in a list of physical constants. And the reason for that, if you think about it, is just the universe has trillions of planets. And by randomness alone, if, if each of those planets was just randomly, mindlessly allocated to a certain distance from its 
host star. Odds are very high you'll get some mindlessly that are just in that Goldilocks range for life as we know it. So the fact that our particular planet is, is thermally right for life is not good evidence that there's a God. That's why we, we, we refer to th pretty universal features, right? Pretty universal features um, to infer a maker. But you got a list of maybe six items, six examples of fine tuning, or maybe three, one, two, three. And you, you, you roughly, based on the expert's testimony, or if you're an expert yourself, you, you estimate the improbability of that particular constant being true. So how, how likely is it that, you know, by randomness alone, that our universe would have the expansion rate it, it does or did, let's say it's one in a thousand, how, what are the odds that the strong nuclear force was just that strength and not a little stronger, a little weaker? Well, let's say it's one in a thousand. Some of these are more like one in a million to the power of something. Some of these are more like one in 500, but uh, just, well, remember the way we calculate uh, odds is by multiplying the fractions. So if, if, if we got all three of these, I, I don't know what the third example is, but if you got three of these constants in place and the odds of each is one in a thousand, then the odds of all three being true together are uh, one in a thousand times one in a thousand times one in a thousand, which gives you a much smaller number, one in a billion. So this, this is the, the statistical logic of the fine tuning argument. If you've got four or five or nine or 10 or 39 of these, these, these uh, improbable features of our universe, you get a pretty minuscule number at the end of it. And this, this number, this one in a billion or whatever it ends up being, this is, if we translate it into the fine tuning argument, this is, th these are the odds that our universe would have happened without a God, right? One in a billion is the odds that we've got a well-ordered universe without a God overseeing it. Okay. Well, Objections to the fine tuning argument. Remember we started when we talked about Paley with that list of objections and I put off the fifth objection to now. The fifth objection, well, maybe this is, I, I, you know, I, I, I talked about the displacement objection being the deepest. This is, this is a very deep objection too. And this is the view that natural order, like fine tuning examples, is local and randomly occurs within a larger chaos. It's, it's funny to say that the universe is local, but it could be that what we call the universe is just a small swath of a much larger reality. Or it could be that physically the, the universe is all there is, like there's, there's no bigger room that the universe is situated in, but it's perceptually local and that we filter it in our perception and we are really only capable of perceiving its ordered aspect and the order we perceive is actually just the surface or the filtered output of a much deeper uh, roiling, boiling chaos. And if you got a big enough chaotic cauldron once in a while, something pretty orderly is going to bubble to the surface without, without anyone overseeing the pot and following a recipe. Order is going to emerge now and then, right? It's the, the million monkeys on a million typewriters thing. Put a million monkeys on a million typewriters and let them bang away. Um, and eventually one of them is going to write, if not all of Shakespeare's Hamlet and the first page of Shakespeare's Hamlet to the letter. 
by randomness alone. Now, Dawkins actually in, in The Blind Watchmaker calculates uh, the, the odds of that happening. I think um, it wasn't even the first page of Hamlet, it was just one line of Hamlet. He calculated the odds of the monkeys outputting even one line from Hamlet. The odds are very low. You gotta give those monkeys a lot of time. But anyway, uh, maybe reality has had a lot of time. Maybe reality has had all the time in the world to output order once in a while. So what we observe in the order, what we call the universe and life, this is maybe just a little bubble of, or a little uh, brief flowering of randomly generated order within a larger chaotic reality. <clears throat> so this is, this is a deep way of countering the whole uh, kind of uh, logic of the design argument. Well, it's respecting the logic of the argument. It's accepting the problem of design and then offering a countering explanation to it. Uh, a little more structured than chaos is the idea of a multiverse. A uh, multiverse, think of universe being a single verse or order and a multiverse is just many of those so uh, maybe we exist in a multiverse meaning what we identify as the universe this 14 billion year old mm, concatenation of galaxies and what have you this is just one of a kind uh meaning there's a there's a whole bunch of them and we've just got one example of it we live in and this larger thing is the multiverse maybe there are a million universes maybe there are a trillion maybe there are three maybe you got more than one though it's a multiverse and um, if it's a multiverse, if reality is a multiverse, and uh, even if there's no one overseeing it, if it's just if just each universe is sort of randomly generated um, mindlessly, and so each universe is different from its neighbor because of this rolling of the dice, well, you get enough universes, and and one of them is bound to be what's called biophilic or friendly to life and one of these universes is bound to at some point output philosophy classes like ours where people sit around scratching their heads asking how did this get so ordered right. so the the multiverse response to the argument from design is is an example of this objection you know that natural order is local meaning our universe is local within a larger, not quite chaos, but there's a chaotic element to the multiverse in this view, which is um, the randomness that generates the, you know, the, mm, the, uh, the features of each, each universe in it. One way of picturing a multiverse, I, I mean, in the, la the last picture we pictured, it was kind of the cauldron picture of a multiverse where each bubble was a universe. You can also imagine each of these bubbles is a whole universe historically from beginning, from bang to maybe crunch. And then in the maelstrom of the bang crunch, you get another universe generated. Expansion, expansion, contraction, crunch after X trillion years. And then bang, crunch, bang, crunch. This is the bang, crunch cycle of a single oscillating universe. Though it's a, the whole thing is a multiverse, meaning there are many universes here. But there are never two universes at the same time in this picture. The same quote unquote time. I guess uh, space and time are so bound to each other after Einstein. Uh, that those quote marks are required. But um, here the chaos would be in the bang crunch moment. There's just in the maelstrom the, of that bang crunch and the high temperatures and density of the bang crunch, you get just a reversion to chaos. It's the wiping of the Etch-a-Sketch clean. And uh, the parameters for the new universe are re-rolled. It's like the beginning of the Dungeons and Dragons session each time, and you're re-rolling the attribute characteristics, uh, the attribute uh, values for that universe. So, uh, bang, crunch, dice are re-rolled, and oh, looks like we got a strong nuclear force that's a little bit weaker than the last one. 
as it turns out, and this one's too weak for um, heavy elements to form. The biocosm hypothesis, hypothesis first of all meaning a little bit speculative and offered a little bit conjecturally, um, bio meaning life and cosm meaning cosmos. So biocosm means picturesquely here a living universe. It's like the Gaia hypothesis on amphetamines. What do we mean by bio? What do we mean by alive? Well, we mean the universe like the uh, zebra, like the uh, virus, is subject to this triple engine of natural selection, variation, selection or filtering, transmission of the organism's attributes to the next generation, and repeat. And you let this engine run long enough, give it enough chances, and you get the zebra with its stripes. You get that from <clears throat> an, initial, an initial fairly chaotic environment. So we can ask, well, what, what does this engine operate on? We're familiar um, applying this engine to life as we know it, meaning the Earth Zoo. But Darwin has really given us this, this very deep process, which in principle could, could explain all kinds of things. So if you look at meme theory, um, we can apply this Darwinian logic to explain cultural evolution where the things varying are ideas or words or habits. And the selecting is people choosing one habit or one word or one joke to share with their friends over all the other ones impinging upon their in inbox that day. And the transmission is the sending uh, in which there's a fidelity retained with the original. Of course, in the modern electronic information environment, the transmission is usually perfect. When I send you a copy of a cute meme that made me laugh, you get the exact file that I looked at. There's no corruption of it, typically. Biologic life didn't work quite so perfectly. In biologic life, I think there's a higher chance of uh, mutation occurring, which is a corruption of the information transmission. And to a certain extent, life has relied on that corruption to create variety. <clears throat> One way that we get variety in life is through corruption of the information or accidental um, modulation of the information. Okay, so this is, this is I called it the triple engine of uh, natural selection or at least evolution. I'm not sure which would be the most accurate to pin it to, but the biocosm hypothesis, which, which I think this is the term that James Gardner gave it around the turn of the millennium. And the idea, I guess, has some progenitors in, uh, I think he names Lee, the physicist Lee Smolin as a uh, so one of the early speculators on this view. Um, Biocosm says, well, let's apply this Darwinian engine to, not really this, this is a spiral galaxy, but to universes. What if universes within the larger multiverse ecology are being varied and selected and transmitted in the way life on Earth is so that just as the order of the zebra, its stripes and the coherence of its um, parts for zebra action are, are the result of a Darwinian process. The order we now observe in our universe, including the fundamental constants, are the result of, of this process. That the universe has been competing with other universes uh, for some limited resource like energy. 
the multiverse has finite energy and universes require energy to run. And the universes that most efficiently use that energy and uh, um, uh, are able to uh, move to where the energy is densest, just like you move to where the, to the tree the apples are, are uh, ripening on to take in its energy. And that mobility is a bequeathment of your evolution in a very competitive environment. Um, the universes that have order will survive and spread. The spreading is itself a kind of order. Chaos, almost by definition, maybe the best definition of chaos is that which does not repeat. And you know, order is a kind of sequence or repetition. <clears throat> and um, life, just the repetition involved in the Darwinian process is already a high degree of order, right? Um, so uh, anyway, this is the biocosm hypothesis. It's, it's a kind of response here to the problem of design. And it, you can use it as a kind of fusion of the religious and the more um, naturalist responses to the problem of design. Um, stewards, a steward of the universe would benefit the universe. That is a universe that has within it conscious, interested agents competent engineers who love their universe and want it to continue, want it to thrive and maybe spread. That universe will do better than a universe which has no steward in it. So it's in a universe's interest to evolve within it what we call life things like us who care about the universe. It's in the Earth's interest, getting more specific, it's in the Earth's interest to have creatures in it or hovering above it who um, care about it. We have that potential. We humans have that potential to become true caretakers of the Earth, true uh, angelic overseers of this biosphere. Uh, right now, we're a little bit demonically destroying it, but uh, we, we clearly have this capacity and will also competing with that destructive tendency to um, assist the earth. And that's because we have the engineering capability now to, to have global effects in what we do. We can make it rain now, pretty much. And um, where will our engineering be in a thousand years or 10 million years. 10 million years is not that long in cosmic time. It's really a blink of cosmic time. And assuming we can survive 10,000 years or our AI descendants can survive 10 million years. Um, I mean, the sky and beyond is the limit here. I mean, Right now, we, we, are, we are just beginning to engineer uh, consciously on a global scale. That is, our projects have global effects, again, often destructively, right? The in, our industrializing of life is having global effects, and our nuclear weapons have global effects. I've already had that in the 3,000 we let off in our so-called tests. But, um, you know, we could start engineering on a solar scale and a galaxial and cosmic scale too. And that would be good for the universe, right? That we could start to really hack the universe at a deep level and figure out how to get it spread. We could say, well, here we can kind of uh, collapse the universe and its code into a little arc and fly that arc off like a paper plane into the wider multiverse and seed the adjacent multiverse with the code of our universe, which we love so much. And uh, this is, I mean, this is obviously in the realm of now science fiction. The uh, screenshot from Kubrick's 2001 is maybe appropriate for that reason. But um, <clears throat> by, you know, speculating from the biocosmic starting point, we get to something quite godlike. I mean, 
When you talk about a steward of a universe, you're talking about something godlike. If we start seeding this universe, if we send the, the code of this universe off to create other universes, well, relative to those other universes, we are the creator of that universe. And when we are now asking within our particular universe, how did it get to be so ordered? How did our fine tuning constants get to be so well tuned? The direct answer, according to this biocosm steward hypothesis, the direct answer is, well, a, a, a steward, a steward engineer of our parent universe or our prior universe in the oscillating stream made our universe or seeded our universe or tweaked our universe. But of course, the, the deep, if you then ask, well, how did that steward happen? The Darwinian logic of the biocosm hypothesis does take you back eventually to something a bit more chaotic. So if, if you want to, uh, you know, by this biocosm route, if, if you're not going to get to a God who's there before anything happens. And we'll see one of the really dug in beliefs of, of, of theism is that God is first, that before the universe, there was God before anything like disorder, there was order that order is It's not just that order wins in the Darwinian picture, order wins. Maybe forgetting about the second law of thermodynamics for now, but in the, the, the Orthodox Christian Muslim Jewish view, order doesn't just win order already won order was there in the beginning. In the beginning was the word in the beginning was God. This is not, I mean, this is a, a, a Western theistic view. It's not a universal view in the Greek view. And then at least according to the Greek muse who appeared to Hesiod around 2,700 years ago, the first thing was chaos. The, the, there in the beginning was in the beginning, there was chaos. And from the chaos, the gods emerged and gods have parents too but the the ultimate parent in this greek view is chaos all right well so much for the argument from design let's move on to the next item in our list of Let's call them overdramatically proofs for God's existence. None of these is quite a proof, except, you know, the ontologic argument presents itself as a kind of logical proof. Whether, whether it works, we'll have to decide. You'll have to decide. But um, our second argument, these are all arguments more or less for believing in something like God. This one is re really a family of arguments called the cosmologic family of arguments. And the name is not that helpful. I mean, okay, something to do with the cosmos and logic. But uh, other than that, um, the title doesn't tell you much. Cosmologic arguments uh, are, I, I think, quite similar to the design argument, and, and they're easy to confuse with the design argument. And um, I think the first difference is they, they operate at a much um, greater level of abstraction or generality. In the argument from design, you're from fair specific observations about the order of your environment of the universe you're inferring the existence of a designer in the cosmologic argument you're you're making the same sort of move you're going from observations about your reality to the conclusion that there's a source of that reality but the observations you're making are of a very general nature. I mean, you can see here in Aquinas's famous, well, they were, there are five ways, Aquinas proposed five ways to belief in God. And the first three are really what we would today call cosmologic arguments. And uh, way one begins with the observation or the premise that some things are in motion. 
you want to oh, there's something in motion you want um you want to convince people with an argument by beginning with premises or assumptions that they are likely to share um, there's no use trying to convince someone by using starting from assumptions that that themselves are in need of argument so here uh, you can see there's uh, something already in Aquinas's favor he's starting with a premise that is pretty hard to dispute and from from pretty much that premise, I mean, with a little bit of help, and I've, I've given a dot, dot, dot here, um, you get to the conclusion that there must be a first mover that is itself unmoved. Capital M here is just to indicate that this thing probably is worth worshiping or worth uh, speaking of with a little bit of deference because it's very special. Um, everything we encounter in this world is in some way or another in motion. I mean, we know that of even things that for now appear to be quite still. If you watch a two million year long video recording of Mount Everest, you'll see it ever so slowly. Uh, uh, is it growing or shrinking? It's, I know it's one of the newer mountains, but anyway, it's, it's moving up or down and expanding or contracting very slowly and even some you know a block of iron that just stays in the same block of plutonium that stays in the same position for the entire history of the universe everything around it is moving so relatively it's it's moving and uh internally it's in it's a whirl of motion at the atomic level anyway some things are in motion at least it, notice that aquinas's premise is just that some things are in motion if he can get you to agree that at least some things are moving if not all of them then he'll get you to the conclusion that there's got to be something at the origin of it all at the origin of all motion at the beginning of the chain of cause and effect and in fact that's way two way two is it's really like a variation on way one or the there it's the, it's the, it's the same argument expressed differently slightly different focus so now we begin with the presumption that or the observation very general observation that some things are caused this this word efficiently you can look up i mean if you google efficient cause efficient cause uh, this is a term from the greek philosopher aristotle um it's, it's pretty equivalent to what we just normally mean by cause. Aristotle distinguished between four kinds of causes and Aquinas, like, like almost all philosophers of his day, and like most medieval philosophers for that whole thousand year period, were working in the Aristotelian tradition with a lot of Aristotelian conceptual machinery and presumption. Anyway, this is a sort of Aristotelian term and look just notice that some things are caused <clears throat> like uh your haircut oh i like your haircut yeah it's the effect of my barber's scissor work oh i like your barber's scissors yeah they're the effect of you know the factory in china that made them oh i like those chinese people yeah, they're the effect of their mommies and daddies. I like their mommies and daddies. Yeah, they're the effect of their mommies and daddies. And so on and so on and so on. I mean, we can do this for things that are moving too. I like that red billiard ball that's moving westward. Yeah, it's moving westward because of the white billiard ball that struck it. Oh, I like that white billiard ball. Yeah, it's moving because of the pool cue that struck it. And we can talk about the pool player then and his mommies and daddies or her mommies and daddies but mommy and daddy and so on and so on and so forth there must be a first capital c cause itself uncaused itself uncaused because of its cause then we're on that chain still the, the point of the the problem with this chain is it feels like it's it's not explained it's not grounded until we get to something that um, is very different from the subsequent items in the chain. Right? And 
way to here a, a contemporary philosopher, uh, William Rowe, here is sort of summing up Aquinas's second way. So this is a quote from Rowe. It is obvious that if B right now is causing A to exist, and C is B's mommy caused B to exist, or you know, if we're talking about present tense, causing B to exist, I guess your mommy is no longer causing you to exist. If you're B, what's, try to think of something that's right now, right now, continuously, actively contributing to your existence. You might have to talk about something like oxygen or just the maintenance of a certain atmospheric pressure, you know, the elevation of which would crush you, and the reduction of which would dissipate you. But if, if, if A is caused by B and B is caused by C, and C and everything prior to C is just the same, that there's something before it causing it, according to Aquinas, no causing would be occurring at all. That is, the whole thing would be unfounded, the whole chain would be unfounded and actually wouldn't exist. So, I mean, this is really what's going on in both way one and way two, and, and, and with way three, too, that... Um, we notice the first thing. We notice one thing in our world that's moving or that is an effect that is that is caused by something else. And we realize that the thing prior to it had a cause too. And then we don't need to keep observing. What we then do is just intellectually, we understand the nature of this relationship. And we logically, you know, abstractly, conclude that there's got to be something very special you know like a um call it x call it item x at the beginning of the whole series and x does not cannot have something prior to it i want to draw an x here now to say no but that would be confusing um okay let's call this asterisk god is asterisk okay and if we ask, well, what's prior to it? The answer is nada. My messy X looks a bit like an asterisk, I realize. Okay, um, hopefully you get the point. Way three uh, is the trickiest to get a handle on because it's got these terms contingent and necessary, which you've heard before, I'm sure, but uh, um, especially necessary, but um, they're used here in a technical, philosophical sense. Might be an Aristotelian distinction again, uh, most likely. Anyway, when we say that some things are contingent, we, we mean that they are uh, dependent, dependent for their existence on something else. So, I mean, Way three like is like way one and way two. I, again, all three are like variations on the same idea. And it's just Aquinas is through these slightly different paths, getting at the same argument, the same inference, I think. Um, but God has many facets, I guess, like a, like a cut diamond, many facets, and uh, they're all reflecting the same light, uh, the same carbon, but um, we get different glimmers depending on which which facet the light is bouncing off of. So contingent, or uh, rather we're talking about God, the diamond, uh, we can see this thing as necessary, we can see this thing as the first cause, we can see this thing as the first mover, we can get more specific as we do in the design argument and call, call it the designer, the planner, the architect, the programmer. Um, maybe these are all different ways of um, uh, perceiving and expressing 
and focusing on the very same the very same entity the very same feature of that entity anyway a necessary being is a being that has to exist you and i are contingent meaning we didn't have to exist um, and to and to see that you just got to notice how um flimsy our existence is flimsy in that it it just depends on all these other things having happened or happening or being in place and if any of any one of those things were different we would not exist you know if your mommy and daddy just were not feeling in the mood in the mood that night uh you would not exist and um what got them in the mood well that you know love works in mysterious ways and uh there's so many factors uh you know just uh, half a glass less of wine or the wrong Barry White song that comes up on the hi-fi or whatever, 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 you know, you, um, you don't happen. You don't happen. Our existence and every, everything that happens to you is so contingent, so contingent on exteriors, things outside of your control. This is, just a, a way of saying you're very powerless and very dependent on so much outside of you and everything you encounter in this world is like that even when it seems quite powerful it, it has a mommy and daddy and many mommies and daddies in its environment like atmospheric pressure and oxygen that are um, sustaining it in existence the necessary being would be one which uh, does all the sustaining or at least sustains the first thing that gets everything going. Um, and there's nothing sustaining it. It's a self-existent or self-sustaining being. This this third way is, is, you know, the hardest to really get a grasp on. There's some real abstraction occurring here. If you're confused right now, you should be. Um, there are two kinds of confusion in philosophy. The first confusion is just really not knowing what's going on. Like just having no idea what contingent means and no idea what necessary means and having to look them up in a dictionary. And then, you know, we talk for a bit and you read a bit and then you start to get some understanding of what's what these sentences on this slide mean. And that, <clears throat> that initial confusion is hopefully cleared up. <coughs> but um, sort of paradoxically, um, in philosophy as you start to clear up that first confusion a second deeper confusion should start to fill its place and that's the confusion that maybe never goes away that's the confusion which motivates maybe a lifetime of monastic study of these problems um, philosophical problems are typically problems that you never completely solve you might you might think for a time that you've solved them I'm sure Aquinas had his had his nights in the oh many many decades in the monastery. He was writing his great philosophical works. I'm sure he had many nights where he felt like he had solved something, proved something. Though apparently at the end of his life he had a mystical experience in the monastic chapel, and he declared after it that all his work, all his life's work was like straw, all the paper he had written, these great philosophical works are like straw compared to the revelation he'd experienced. Here's uh, Samuel Clark writing in uh, 1700s, at least a couple hundred years ago. Here's his cosmological argument. As I said, the cosmological argument is a, it's a family of arguments and uh, there are different ways you can get at this core idea. Uh, he uses the term dependent and self-existence and I've cheated when I was talking about Aquinas's third way. I already kind of used these terms. Um, Aquinas says necessary and contingent, Clark says self-existent and dependent. But here's the argument, here's the conclusion, marked by that magic word, therefore, one and two, therefore three. That's the logic of the argument. 
that's the flow of it. The first premise is that every being, everything that exists or ever did exist is either, either a dependent being or a self-existent being. Either a dependent being or a non-dependent being. A self-existent being is a being that's not dependent on anything else. So this first premise, I think, I think we all have to agree to. It's just the logical claim that everything, each thing is either A or not A. There's no third possibility. The second premise is that not every being can be a dependent being, right? Not every single being can be dependent. That's just like the thought we had about Aquinas's first two ways. Uh, in the first way we said, not every being can be caused to move by something prior to it. In the second way we said, not every being can be uh, a little bit more generally, I guess, an effect caused by something prior to it. There's got to be something at the beginning of it all, which grounds it all, which guarantees it all, which holds it all up, which starts it all, right? Where the buck stops. That's the idea behind all the cosmological arguments. Whether we call that thing the self-existent one, or the necessary one, or the uncaused one, or the unmoved one, it's the same idea. So there's this self-existent being. You are not self-existent. You might have moments where you feel quite independent of all the things that bind you, but uh, partly that's just ignorance being bliss. You're just not thinking of all the things that keep you going. So a de dependent being, these are just our definitions to be absolutely clear. A dependent being is one whose determining reason lies in the causal activity of other beings. A self-existent being is one whose determining reason lies within its own nature, very mysterious. Of course, the self-existent being is, when you understand this definition, very different from anything we encounter directly in this world, and that's as it should be. We're inferring God here. We're not inferring um, you know, rice cakes. Here's the principle underlying the whole thing, guaranteeing the whole thing. The principle of sufficient reason, hard to get a more general principle than this. Each fact must have a reason or a cause. This is the universe. This is a, um, a Polaroid uh, a snapshot of the universe. I joke when I say Polaroid, of course, but uh, uh, this is a kind of map of the, what, the observable universe. Um, and uh, of course, it's also a selfie of the universe. We are the universe where we emerge from the universe. We are the universe looking at itself. So this is the universe's first selfie. I think it's pouting right here. It's pouting. And right here it says, please subscribe and hit the like button. Um, each fact must have a reason or a cause. This is called the principle of sufficient reason. I believe this is, yes, Leibniz, the German philosopher, Leibniz, who articulated it, let's not say invented it. This is an idea which underlies a lot of human effort and inquiry. I think when we are motivated to solve a mystery, we are presuming that there's got to be a reason for it. We don't, we don't think that some things just happen and there's no reason or cause for them at all. Rather, we think... Some things happen and they're mysterious to us because we're not smart enough or we haven't tried yet to figure out what caused them, right? Uh, if you think that way, then you're accepting PSR. And the, the cosmologic arguments, I guess, uh, certainly the third way, certainly Clark's version explicitly rely on this principle of sufficient reason. Here's the chain of dependence. That's you, that's your mommy, grandma, great grandma. Or if you want to think of um, uh, things you depend on that are contemporary with you, that would be oxygen, that would be whatever maintains or creates oxygen, and that's whatever creates that or maintains that. And so this is, you, you might say, um, uh, 
what Clark's argument is telling us is this is an absurd picture of reality. If there's not something holding it all up or something kind of at the beginning that stops it, guarantees it. If it was just a sort of an infinite chain going back into the past or into the depths of reality infinitely, we would say, according to PSR, that's absurd because there's got to be something that explains the whole thing then, right? PSR demands that there's an explanation for this whole shooting match but the whole you say wants a cause i answer that the uniting of these parts into a whole is performed merely by an arbitrary act of the mind and has no influence on the nature of things did i show you the particular causes of each individual item in a collection I should think it very unreasonable, should you afterwards ask me, what was the cause of the whole? This is sufficiently explained in explaining the parts. So Hume's point is that, I can't jump back to the last slide here uh, without interrupting this recording I'm doing, but um, as far as I know, but uh, thinking back to that last diagram of a sort of chain of dependent beings, Hume is saying, look, if, if there's an explanation for each item, each D on that line, then that's an explanation for the whole. The whole is nothing more than the parts. This word we have, whole, is useful. It's practically useful. It's a way of uh, summing things up with a single word in, instead of pointing to every apple and every leaf and every square inch of bark i just point to the thing and say the tree it's a useful word for um efficient communication but uh, the tree is nothing more than the sum of its parts and that's true of any whole and that's true of the capital H whole, capital W whole, which is the universe. The universe is a useful term for us today when we want to think about the big picture, but the universe is nothing more than all its parts. And if <clears throat> the whole is composed of its parts and each part in principle has an explanation in terms of the thing prior to it, well, then this whole thing has an explanation. Now, if we're thinking in terms of cause and effect um, through time, one thing happens, causes the next thing, the next thing causes the thing after that. And we take Hume's uh, advice here to explain the whole just by explaining the parts, then we'd be led on a kind of infinite regress it seems we'd have to posit a universe with no beginning a universe with no beginning but why not in a universe with no beginning each item in the universe could be caused by the thing prior to it the whole is infinite the whole goes back eternally but um, the whole has an explanation because for each thing you point to, however far back you go, uh, however far back you point at a D, we can always point to the D before it to identify its cause or the, the thing that sustains it or that it's dependent on. So, um, sure, an infinite universe is weird and mind-boggling infinite whatever way you cut it infinite into the future infinite going
going out in space, infinite in time going back. It's, it blows the mind, boggles the mind. It, uh, it transcends our ability to picture and really conceive clearly. But look, any, any story we can tell about what explains the whole thing is going to be a little mysterious and mind blowing. And it's going to refer us to something which is a little bit outside ordinary experience. If it's God, there you go. You've got, you know, if what explains the universe is this necessary being who can move and cause other things to move, but is not itself moved by anything else, this thing that has power, but is not powered by anything else. This is quite mysterious too. This is not, I mean, it might be correct. It might be the correct solution to explaining the cosmologic problem, but it still leaves you with something a little bit weird at the end of it. On the other hand, if, 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 um, let's say what, what happened is there was nothing, there was nothing. And then something just popped into existence that the first thing was uncaused, but it just, it just popped into existence. It wasn't self-caused. It in a way was quite arbitrary, but it's, it was arbitrary by a kind of randomness. Well, that's weird too, that there would be nothing. I mean, the nothingness alone is weird that there would be nothing. And then something pops into existence. That's weird that that raises questions like, well, why did, why did it pop into existence then and not before or after? Why did it pop at all? Uh, and if there's no why to the why, that's, that's, that's quite mysterious too. And uh, here in Hume's picture, maybe if things just go back eternally, that's quite mysterious and mind blowing too. You mean that there's no beginning? There's no first thing, first special thing. There's no first arbitrary thing. Things just go back infinitely with no beginning. They go back forever. Wow. But is that, first of all, is that really any weirder than the idea that things go forward forever? I think most of us are much more comfortable with the idea that things go forward forever. I mean, even if you believe the world ends in an apocalypse and then the smoke clears and some of us go up to heaven or whatever, you. You, you kind of believe that we continue existing. There's some kind of continued existence in the afterlife or in heaven. Things keep going. Um, so, I mean, is the idea that things didn't begin any weirder than that? I don't think so. So Hume is saying, if you can explain the whole, you can solve the problem, the cosmological problem, by just positing a system in which each part has a explanation of the thing prior to it. And uh, so this um, prevents the inference to God's existence. Right, let's spend a, a little bit of time on this rarest of the five arguments. This is the argument um, which I think even most professional philosophers have not heard of or considered. These other four, uh, you would, if you took philosophy of religion at any university in the English speaking world and beyond probably, you would cover these four arguments almost certainly. Um, the axiarchy argument you're getting in this course, partly because I like it. I'm maybe partial to it, but uh, um, don't be surprised if your other philosophy prof says, huh? When you, when you ask him or her about this argument. Anyway, uh, here's the modest axiarchic view. The world exists because it is good. Here's, here's the argument. Uh, well, more an explication of this. 
Uh, one, it would be good if reality were a certain way. Reality is that way. The truth of one explains two. Uh, this is how this is isn't this how Derek Parfit puts it? It'd be good if reality were a certain way. Reality is that way, and reality is that way because it would be good if it were. This is the axiarchic view that reality exists because it is good. The goodness is magical. The goodness is the lever which gets things into existence. Don't smuggle God in here yet, yet. Uh, the axiarchic view it's not quite an argument for God. It's an argument for good. <laughs> it's an argument for a capital G good, which is the cause of the universe, which is getting you pretty close to something you might call God. But what we're saying here is not just that God's a good dude. God's a good guy. And uh, God thought, wouldn't it be nice? to have a, uh, a big hamster environs where my children could play. Wouldn't it be nice to have children, dependents, whom I could care for and nurture and help grow? And so let it be. Let there be a world. No, that's, that's not the axiarchic view. That's just the common theologic view that there was a super person who existed independently and then at one point decided to create a world and makes it good because he or she or it is good. The axiarchic view is that there is no person, there need not be a person before it all, that rather the that the world is good is what causes it to exist. That logically, when, when we say something is good, we are saying it ought to be. Ought to be. O U G. I'm writing with my mouse here, sorry. Ought to be. Well, this is a magic word. Ought to be. When you say um, what you did was was really good, or it's it's good to better example me. It's good to help your elderly parents. I th I think we're saying you ought to do it. If it's good, you ought to do it. Oh, if that oh there that pizza is really really good. We're saying you ought to try it. Our moral evaluative descriptions have this word ought lurking beneath them. Uh, often it's made explicit, often when we're being very explicit or articulate, like in philosophical discourse, we use the word ought. One ought to do X or one ought not to do Y. So the axiarchic view is, is that this word ought has real power real power um of course it has power to get you to do the right thing when you recognize the correct ought statement when you realize that oh i ought to do this that's motivation for you to do it it's it's not always sufficient motivation they're countervailing motivations so you might know that you ought to help your elderly parents but you might also feel like surfing pornography that saturday you know, spending your entire Saturday going deep into a porn hole. And uh, you know, and, and okay, so you, you surf porn that Saturday. It's going to be a bit of a guilt-ridden porn trip because you know all the while that you ought to be helping your elderly parents. That guilt is evidence that the ought, that the good has power. The good has power to pull you mentally towards doing the right thing even while you're physically slumped in your chair um, and I'll leave the picture there but um, um, the ought has power at the psychological individual level to motivate you often into actually doing it 
but it at least has that gravitational pull, which manifests in guilt. Okay, so that's just at the individual level. Well, the axiarchic view is that at the cosmic level, the ought has power, that the ought has enough power to lever a world into existence from nothing, from nothing. Um, and if we ask, yeah, but why or how does the world exist? You say, because it's good. It exists because it ought to. The ought has real, real power, right? Right, well, three down, two to go. Let's talk now about the pragmatic argument, which uh, I think it's quite different from the other four. It uh, really does not offer any kind of evidence that God exists. It's not trying to, it's not trying to convince you that God exists. The argument from design, um, grab my pen here. The argument from design, the cosmologic argument, clearly are trying to take you to a conclusion that something in the neighborhood of God exists or take you to the conclusion that something with at least one of God's key attributes exists, right? The creator of the world, the intelligent, powerful, conscious creator of the world, or in the cosmologic argument, something a, a little more abstract, the causal uh, origin of the world, or the necessary being that underlies all contingency. Uh, the axiarchic argument is, is uh, um, maybe not quite an argument for God, uh, so-called, but it takes you to some primeval good, something, some sort of non-physical um, abstract reality, which, uh, which necessitates a world. The pragmatic argument, as I said, does not give you any kind of evidence that anything like God exists. What it's trying to do is very different. It's just it's just trying to convince you that it's good for you to believe in God, <laughs> right? And uh, hence the name, the pragmatic argument. So pragmatic arguments, uh, let's say, are a kind of argument with the following logical form. Um, they all take you to the conclusion that you have a reason to do alpha, to do whatever this alpha can stand for. Anything, any action, it's alpha for action. And and the, your, the conclusion is arrived at by these premises. Uh, premise one, doing alpha helps to bring about beta and premise two, it's in your interest that beta happens. So you got a reason to do A. We're thinking this way all the time. I mean, we do this so automatically. This, this um, argument is sort of woven into our DNA practically and it guides a lot of our action. Um, the relation between our mind and our body is partly the relation of just uh, um, working this inference out in, into action. The mind decides that you now have a reason to do A and the body follows. Um, so pragmatic here means um, oriented toward action, toward doing something. Right. Now, the reasons for doing something are, in principle, quite, quite broad. I mean, um, it, you know, um, it's a reason to do something, um, depending on the interests of the, of the agent we're trying to 
convinced. Anyway, uh, what if do A means believe something? Believe is a verb, and it's something you do. You can perform one of the following three actions in the next 10 seconds. You can lift your right hand up in front of your face, and um, or you could um, jump up and down three times, or you could believe something. <laughs> Believing is a action, so it's a mental action. Fine. And the pragmatic argument for God's existence is trying to show you that you have a reason to do what? To start believing something, to start believing, if you're not already, in a uh, deity who, in particular, uh, has arranged reality so that we creatures are rewarded or punished in the afterlife or something like an afterlife for our actions, including our beliefs on earth. <clears throat> so this argument, I don't think Blaise Pascal, the French uh, thinker, uh, called it this. I'm not sure at what point theologians and philosophers gave it the title, the pragmatic argument, but the, the two most famous uh, examples of it in the literature are Pascal's. I mean, Pascal's version of it is almost synonymous with the argument itself. Um, uh, Pascal's very famous wager, the Pascalian wager. And we'll briefly look at an idea from William James's, James's famous essay, The Will to believe, which has a kind of uh, pragmatic argument for belief in not quite God, but something, something good and eternal, maybe. So uh, Jordan is our contemporary uh, explicator of Pascal, and Jordan uh, pulls out three wagers. I mean, it's called the wager, Pascal's famous wager, but in the uh, in the text that Pascal wrote, which was really a kind of bedside journal, I, I gather, he kept over the years, where he put down his thoughts. It's called the Pensées, his thoughts. Um, in the Pensées, he, he, I think the most famous section of the Pensées is what we've, what I he calls the wager, uh, or we've come to call it. And, and Jordan says there are really three wagers. I mean, it's the same argument, but uh, um, he, he, each is a variety of the same basic argument. So here's, th these are in, in, in blue quotes from Jordan, and Jordan's just um, speaking on behalf of Pascal. So Pascal says, one cannot lose when wagering on the existence of God rather than against God. In the event that God exists, one who believe does very well, you go to heaven, let's say. Uh, Pascal's thinking within Catholic metaphysics here. Um, in the event that God does not exist, one who believes does no worse than one who does not believe. There's no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, and then your believing didn't really uh, cost you anything. Um, so this is, I mean, this is, the, you've got all the key ideas of the wager here in this, this first version, right? The idea that um, you stand to gain a lot if, one, you believe in God, and two, there is a God, right? If those two things happen um, or are true, then you stand to gain something very good. You're going to do very well. Maybe infinitely well. We'll see. And you don't really have anything to lose. I mean, that's that's the, here's the thrust of the argument. It's just you have a lot to gain, potentially, from believing in God and pretty much nothing to lose. So why wouldn't you do it? That's the, that's the pragmatic argument. That's the wager. And then we get a little more mathematically specific as we go through wager two and, and wager three. And, and Pascal sort of turns up the volume on the argument and really, um, really um, uh, makes his claim a bit bolder. 
by its specificity. Uh, so here's wager two, um, or just call it, I, I would rather think of it as the wager version two or something like that. But uh, if the probability of God existing is equal to that of God not existing, and given that the utility of theistic belief, theistic belief is belief in God, if God exists is infinite, so it's not just that uh, you're going to do very well now if you believe in God and God exists. It's that the the utility or the um, va value of believing in God, if God exists, is infinite. God will reward you for your belief. This is the idea. Maybe it's a very Catholic idea. But the idea is that you will be rewarded by God for your belief with something infinitely good which is eternal life in something like paradise or eternal uh, an eternal relationship in close proximity with the source of all good and all reality that's god i mean whatever heaven is it's i mean the it's first of all being close to god and god is the good and so if you get to be close to that perfectly good thing forever and share in its glory, that's an infinite good, right? I mean, Pascal's a mathematician and he's, he's doing some statistical, pra practical statistics here. And he's saying the value of this particular um, branch of the wager is infinite. So the utility of believing, the benefit of believing swamps, infinity swamps, uh, the utility of disbelief. The utility of disbelief would be the conservative um, utility of whatever you might gain or avoid losing by just not believing in God. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe, but uh, let's, let's check out Wager 3.0. As long as there is some positive probability that God exists. It follows, since infinity multiplied by any finite amount generates an infinity, that the expected utility of believing that God exists swamps that of disbelief. So here again, Pascal is just turning the, turning the intensity of the argument up again by saying, look, if, if the good that you stand to gain from believing in God if God exists, is infinite, then as long as there is some probability above zero that God exists, the gambler's expected utility of believing that God exists is, is infinite, truly swamps the other option. See, by this term expected utility is really just, here's the formula for expected utility. It's the probability of P being true multiplied by the benefit of believing P if P is true. Um, so uh, there are two horses, very simple horse race. And uh, 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 one horse that you bet on is called... Uh, harpsichords. I don't know if that's a good name for a racehorse, but uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the probability of harpsichord winning the race is 50%, let's say. That's the, uh, those are the official posted odds. And the benefit of believing or betting on, here by believing it means Xing the right box on your gambler's ticket at the racetrack, but the benefit of believing that uh, that harpsichord will win, if harpsichord wins, is the payoff of the bet, right? It's maybe you get um, 10, 10 times, uh, well, it wouldn't be 10 times on a 50% bet, but let's say you get um, double what you bet, right? Let's say you bet $5. So the benefit of believing that harpsichord will win or betting on harpsichord, if it's true that harpsichord wins, will be $5. Um, uh, we're going to get double. Uh, 
Oh, I've, I've made this example more complicated than I need it to be. <laughs> let's, let's just put it like this. You're going to get 10 bucks if harpsichord wins. And you believe that harpsichord will win. Believe by betting on harpsichord winning. The probability of harpsichord winning is 50% or 0.5, right? It, uh, we, we, we turn all the percentages in, in, into a value between 0 and 1. 1 here represents necessity. 0 represents impossibility or something like that. So um, 0.5 represents a 50% chance of, uh, of harpsichord winning. So the expected... <laughs> This took longer than I had hoped, but uh, the expected utility of um, believing in harpsichord or betting on harpsichord is 0.5, the 50% odds, times the 10 bucks you stand to gain from your $5 bet if harpsichord wins. So that would be 0.5 times $10, that would be $5. So the the expected utility for that example is is five five bucks okay in the in the case of the wager the expect um if god exists and you believe in god you gain not 10 bucks you gain infinity you gain this infinite good of heavenly existence for eternity what are the odds that God exists? Well, here Pascal is saying through Jordan's modern explication that as long as there's some positive probability, and that just means anything above zero, so point zero, even if the odds that God exists are 1%, right, or 0 0.01, um, the expected utility is infinity. If the odds that God exists are like the odds that harpsichord wins, 50%, uh, then the expected utility is still infinity. 0. 0.5 times infinity is infinity. 0. 0.01 times infinity is infinity. Pascal's saying, wow, look, if the, if the good promised by belief in God is truly infinite, then however slim the chances are that God exists, the expected utility of believing in God is infinite. So why wouldn't you do it, right? This is, this is I mean, the gambler's logic is just a slightly mathematized, practical thinking. And so Pascal is saying to his reader, if you're going to be practical, just thinking practically, it does not make sense to not believe in God. <laughs> right. So that's that's the wager. That's the wager. And it, it generates a lot of, you know, there's a whole history of critical discussion of it. It's compelling. There's something <laughs> there's something to it, if only something wrong with it that you need to figure out. Here's here's one objection to Pascal. This is a common one. It goes by different names. We'll call it the partitioning complaint. And this uh, picture of this is religious diversity. This is we got representatives from many of the major world faith traditions and some which seem to be out of this world, perhaps from Planet Rabbit. And uh, I'm not sure what that is. And we don't know that the Easter Island heads were objects of worship, do we? Anyway, this is uh, religious diversity, obviously Hinduism and Buddhism and Jesusism. Um, what's the partitioning complaint or objection? It's that each of these religions promises an infinite good. The infinite good goes by different names. There's a different path uh, prescribed to the devotee to attain that infinite good. So in Buddhism, the infinite good is nirvana, the infinite bliss of which, I guess we got two Buddhas here. That's the more the laughing Chinese Buddha, and that's the more sub Himalayan Indian Buddha. I guess we don't really know what he looked like. He could have looked fairly Asiatic. He was from that very northern region of India, but uh, anywho. <clears throat> each of these religions offers you an infinite good, but the path they offer you and the beliefs you need to take on to follow that path and attain that good are quite different. In fact, in some cases, they're um, contradictory with each other. And <clears throat> so we can come back at Pascal, especially now that, you know, we're... Uh, Pascal was pretty embedded in a Catholic, French Catholic culture, um, just emerging from the medieval period where Catholicism was 
quite a quite a dominant cultural force and and um I think what I, even if you 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 personally are quite devoted to a particular tradition you you're just aware that impinging upon your world are these other well maybe not Zeus anymore that's Zeus but these other uh, traditions and you know that nice seemingly reasonable people follow those other traditions you might in your heart of hearts think they're mistaken you might in your heart of hearts or you might tell them um, that you think they're going to hell <laughs> or they're not going to attain nirvana or moksha or rabbitaria but uh, we are aware that there are these other competing traditions and the problem for the better now whom pascal is addressing he's saying we're all betters we're all here in the world and god either exists or doesn't and you've got to choose It's like the lyrics from the Rush song. Not if you if you do not choose, you still have made a choice. If you do not choose to believe in God, you're therefore you're thereby not believing in God. If you're an agnostic, if you say, uh, "Well, I don't know if there is a God or isn't," so I'm just kind of you know, well, you are not believing in God. Then you either actively believe in God or you don't, and that don't can be the extreme. Um, don't of the very vocal, um, you know, agitated, uh, provocative atheist, like a Richard Dawkins, or it could just be the the quieter, humbler, um, retreating no of the agnostic. The agnostic isn't even quite saying no, but they're not saying yes. So you're either saying yes or you're not to God, right? There's no third choice. And uh, so we're all we're all the betters. We are all the betters, whether we realize it or not, whom Pascal is addressing. And we can say to Pascal, well, sure, the the good, uh, the expected utility of of belief in Christian God is infinite, but the expected utility of belief in the eightfold path is sorry to draw on Buddha's um, shapely head here, but. Uh, um, is uh, infinite too and the good promised by um you know uh, one of the yogas karma yoga or uh, bhakti yoga or uh, dhyana yoga or raja yoga or i'm sure there are many other yogas of the subcontinent's path lost i lost my grammatical train there but uh, my point is just that you're now in this kind of stasis where the question is, which one do you bet on? Right. So first of all, we can, I mean, one way of articulating the partitioning complaint or specifying it is to say, well, the, the logic of the wager that Pascal offers gives you equal reason to believe in all these other competing gods. And I don't think Pascal would have liked that. I mean, Pascal was trying to get you to affirm your belief in the Christian God, the, the father of Abraham and Isaac and Yeshua and all that. Um, but we can uh, turn up the volume on the partitioning complaint by pointing out that these traditions are often mutually uh, canceling or self-contradictory. That is, um, if, you, if you're following the Catholic path, you're not following yoga. Um, though actually a lot of a lot of Hindus are quite uh, what's the word uh, you know, they're quite broad and liberal in their interpretation of other faiths they don't see them as competing faiths but uh, but if if you really believe that Jesus is 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 God incarnate and there has been no other um, I, I think a, a lot of Hindus would say that's going to be that's a cognitive limitation that's actually going to hold you back from full enlightenment that's a um, a kind of attachment to a very specific personality who may have been quite divine but it's gonna it's gonna hold you back from full enlightenment right the buddhist path is quite monastic i mean the true buddhist is a monk or a nun who's really renounced like the founder renounced not just the pleasures of life but all the ordinary features of life as we know it like family and um 
and so so there there are these it's not just that these religions have different styles of dress and they all believe in the same thing but they give it different names that's a nice pretty multicultural thought but it's the reality is there are deep differences between these traditions and these paths contradict so the, the wager argument kind of falls apart because it, it no longer gives you a specific reason to believe in the wager or rather the problem is to be a little more mathematical is is if you um it's like the expected utility of god a belief in god is now countered by the expected disutility right of believing in god if believing in god if believing in the christian god prevents you from enlightenment and it, and the um the buddhists are actually correct there is no, there is no christian god but the path of enlightenment is is real and you enlightenment is a real thing you can achieve if you follow it well now the expected utility of belief in god i mean pascal's idea that there's really no um no drawback to believing in god is wrong if there's no god but there is a path of enlightenment and you miss out on the path because you're so busy um, singing hymns in church and feeling self-satisfied that you're going to heaven simply because you believe in god well then the belief has actually prevented you from attaining the true infinite good okay so hopefully that makes the partitioning complaint fairly uh, fairly clear and i'll just close the discussion here our lecture of um the wager by leaving open another objection for you to think about or look up i mean if you look up I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page on the wager itself. If you Google the wager or Pascal's wager, um, there will be a, a page and, and you can start there and you can read some of the other uh, objections that have been proposed through history and maybe, maybe come up with your own or pick your favorite. Right. So here's, here's the one idea from the William James essay I wanted us to, uh, to dwell on james points out i think he's he's right this is a social psychological observation that only by first believing are we opened to decisive intellectual evidence some things are like this maybe not everything but um it might be that there there are some things you can only know if you first uh sort of believe or have something in the neighborhood of belief. You've got some, some, you know, degree of confidence in the claim to act upon it. And then in acting upon it, acting upon that confidence, you actually do attain evidence, direct evidence of the thing. That's pretty abstract. Um, if I tell you that at the end of the road, at the end of the long road, there is a golden fountain, you know, and then I die. And you're like, wait, wait, Paul, did you mean a fountain that, that spews forth liquid gold? Or did you mean a fountain that's made of gold? Or is it metaphorical? Anyway, but you, you trust me, you know enough about me that you, you basically trust things I say. And uh, so you've got some kind of confidence that at the end of the road, there's a golden fountain might be that the road is pretty long and unless you've got some confidence that there is a golden fountain at the end of it you're not going to make the journey so that's a case where you could actually obtain direct evidence of the golden fountain by by drinking from it or putting it in your pocket if it's a very tiny gold trinket um you can have that direct evidence if you walk down the road, but you're probably not going to take that long journey down the road unless you kind of believe it's there. So James is just, he's, he's right there. God, God might be like that too, that there is a way you can know it quite directly, but you're not going to, you're not going to know it directly until you start walking towards it. And you're not going to start walking towards it unless you've already got something like belief in it <laughs> so that's you know when people talk about faith and and when we try to define faith as i mean i think richard dawkins a little bit aggressively um provocatively defines faith as confidence in a belief with no evidence <laughs> or, 
or very little evidence or insufficient evidence. And maybe that's not all that pr provocative. I mean, I, I think that's, that's correct. I mean, if you use that definition of faith to paint all of human religiosity with the same brush, that's false and, uh, you know, unhelpfully provocative perhaps. But uh, if, if you just, if you, if you, if you just use this word faith to refer to beliefs we have without evidence, but which we have quite a, quite a high degree of confidence in, um, that's, that seems like a reasonable use of that English word. And uh, James's point is that it, faith is important for some beliefs if, if you really do want direct evidence about them. That's, so the idea is that faith or confidence in a belief is it's to get you to proper justified belief in the end, hopefully. Hopefully faith is not the kind of thing you need to just hold on to forever. It's like a, something you cash in when you meet the thing you had faith in. So it would be, it would be in your interest to believe in this thing if it's real. Because it promises good things to you, but also um, to actually get the truth of the matter, you need to have a bit of confidence in it first. Ah, just an example. All right, and now we'll talk about our final argument for God's existence. The ontologic argument. Um, like the cosmologic argument, the, the title is not particularly informative. The onto here means being, being or existence. Um, and I guess that's about as general a title for an argument as you could get. I mean, every argument is about existence. It's applying logic to some question of existence. But uh, anyway, name aside, this is uh, one of the famous or maybe infamous, if you're a bit critical, arguments for God's existence. And of all, all the ones we've looked at in the course, I, I think this is the one that um, makes the bold claim of being a kind of proof. Uh, the argument from design does not present itself as a proof for God's existence. It's an argument for God's existence, but it's, it's probabilistic, right? Uh, even, even the most ambitious argument from design merely concludes that given the evidence of order, God or something like God is, is probable that uh, a intelligent, powerful creator is, is the best explanation for the order we find in our environment. The ontologic argument makes the bolder claim that if, if you follow its premises and acknowledge them as true, then you'll be logically compelled into the conclusion that God exists. So just some prep work first, just uh, this is logic 101 or comp sci uh, 101 maybe. An inconsistent claim is false. A claim is just any assertion about what's true. A claim can be false. If it, if it says something's true, if I say it's raining right now and it's not raining, that's a false claim. Okay, assertion, proposition, claim. Um, an inconsistent claim, a claim that is inconsistent with itself, that is, it's self-contradictory, is false. Self-contradiction is a kind of uh, logically uh, condensed <laughs> falsehood. That is, when a claim is self-contradictory, you can tell just by analyzing sort of the logic of the statement that it's false. My claim that it's raining right now might be false if it's not raining right now, as I speak. Um, but the claim itself is not self-contradictory. My claim that it's raining does not contradict itself. It does contradict something. Yeah. It contradicts the world. The world is sunny. And my statement paints the world as raining. So most, most false claims are not self-contradictory. They might be 
um, inconsistent with the speaker's wider set of assertions or their history of assertions on that topic. But we do have these special claims um, which uh, actually contradict themselves. By the time you get to the period at the end of the sentence, the, the sentence has already committed a kind of self-destruction logically. So when I say this is a square circle, if you just unpack the meaning of these terms a little bit, I mean, I think you see right away this is false or absurd, but we can make that absurdity a bit more explicit. Look, a square is, this is not a complete definition of it, but it's it's starting to get in the neighborhood of the definition of a square. First of all, you say it's non-circular. Or whatever else it is, it's non-circular. So when you say this is a square cir circle, you're saying this is a non-circular circle or non-circle circle, and there's the there's the contradiction right there, right? So this claim is clearly false. You don't need to check anything outside of the claim to see that it's false. Normally, we don't make claims that are so blatantly self-contradictory. I think most of the time in practice, when humans commit self-contradiction. It's over the course of several assertions, and it takes a bit of inferential work on the part of the listener or the, or the speaker, if they're being self-critical, to realize that they contradicted themselves, to realize that what they said a minute ago in their speech actually doesn't, uh, isn't consistent with what they're saying right now. Often it's even subtler than that. It's that what they said a minute ago implies a claim which is inconsistent with what they're now saying. So um, most of the time we have to kind of pull out logically infer the inconsistency. But the ontological argument really um, operates on this, um, this fact about contradiction. So let's define God. I've, I've said we're going to come back to this question of how to define God um, through the course. Well, here is uh, Anselm of Canterbury, the medieval theologian who composed the ontological argument. Here's his definition of God. God is a being than which none greater is possible. Please, uh, perceive what's going on grammatically here. Don't leave out the then. Um, then again, maybe I should just state this in a more straightforward way. I don't know we, why we've fallen into this particular locution, but I think I think the, this statement is equivalent to God is the greatest possible being. God is the greatest possible being. And um, we're asked by Anselm to consider such a being in two ways. First of all, imagine that this being exists only in the mind, only in the mind of one who is contemplating it. Uh, that I mean, that, that God is not real. I think we'd say that God is just in your imagination. That's the atheist view, right? The atheists believe that God exists only in the mind of believers. The second option is that God exists in the mind and in reality. This is the theist view. The believer has a kind of picture, image, or concept of God in their mind. So there's that mental God. But that mental God is just, according to the, the Orthodox, just a reflection or an inheritance from the actual God. We've been bestowed maybe with a divine sense to perceive God or think about God from the actual God, the God who exists. In reality, you kind of want to say outside of the mind or outside of the head, but God being non-physical doesn't have a spatial location. So <clears throat> that talk of being outside of the head or outside the mind is, 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 I think we should remember, metaphoric. Well, we're all I'm actually almost done the argument here. I mean, the pieces are all in place now. So when 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 you accept that an inconsistent or self-inconsistent claim is necessarily false, 
And then you define God in the way that Anselm has. You've got the argument. Because according to Anselm, a being, let's just say, let's say a greatest possible being who exists only in the mind is not the greatest possible being. <laughs> the, because there's a greater being. The greater being is the one, is the God who exists in the mind and in reality. Right. So when, when the atheist says, God is just in my head, the atheist is contradicting himself. They're saying, a circle's a square. A circle's a non-circle. They're saying, this greatest possible being is not the greatest possible being. I guess Anselm might just say to them, oh, well, that's not God you're thinking of. You're not making a claim about God. <laughs> if you want to pull your hair out at this point or punch out Anselm in the face, you're not alone. Um, a lot of pe I mean, a lot of people are enthralled with this argument. A lot of people right away say there's, there's something wrong here. There's no way this works. There's some severe logical mistake being made and then the and then the the puzzle is just a, a puzzle of figuring out what anselm's mistake or trick is then again there are people who are quite convinced that anselm has given us maybe the purest kind of conceptual proof for this ultimate reality you know it it, it seems too easy i mean that's part of what's suspicious it just seems too easy this this i that you could just, with a couple of thoughts, see that God necessarily exists. It just seems we've been led to believe that God is the treasure chest at the end of the rainbow in the hidden cavern at the end of the world and time, and, and that it's the hardest thing to get to. Then again, if God is the ultimate and God is the source of everything and the omega, maybe God is the easiest thing to think about and to perceive and to um, affirm the existence of you just need to do a little bit of clearing up of your mental furniture which is what anselm is helping us do so uh, we shouldn't be prejudiced against the argument with with the supposition that proving god's existence is going to be super difficult uh, it might just be a little thing we've missed and anselm discovered it or rediscovered it in the year 1200 or thereabouts and uh, at least one famous atheist was convinced by this. Bertrand Russell, who was, among many things, sort of the um, sort of the Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins of his day, meaning he he was one of the 20th century's first really public, uh, articulate atheists. He wrote a book called "Why I Am Not a Christian." Brit Bertrand Russell, famous British philosopher, active in the 1900s, 10s, 20s, 30s. And uh, he tells the story in his, I think it was his autobiography, tells the story of bicycling through, I think it was Cambridge University, Cambridge campus, maybe on his way to the confectionery and probably smoking a pipe and mind uh, occupied with Anselm's argument, which we're looking at now. He was maybe just reading Anselm or coming out of a seminar and thinking about this ontological proof. And he says he had this flash where it all clicked for a moment and he saw with, with clarity that Anselm's proof worked and he fell off his bicycle. Um, so this famous atheist had a moment of acceptance. God is a being than which none greater is possible or God's the greatest possible being. The ontologic principle underlying um, all this, and this is from Peter van Inwagen's analysis, very lucid analysis of Anselm and, and other versions of the ontologic argument. If X and Y are alike in all respects, save that X exists in reality and Y exists in the mind alone, it follows that X is greater than Y. This is just what what Van Inwagen calls the ontologic principle underlying Anselm's argument. We've used this principle to accuse the atheist of being inconsistent. Um, uh, you know, a good chunk of thinking is just getting clear. A good chunk of philosophy is just getting clear on what we think and getting clear on 
what other people are saying. That's usually the first step to proper criticism. Uh, so once you, once you really explicate, bring into the light of day the assumptions or deep principles that are guiding somebody else's argument, then, you know, they're out in the open. They're, they're easier to um, critique if that's, if that's the direction you're heading in. So you can ask yourself, is, is this, is this true? If not, uh, what, why, why do you doubt it? Here's a, a, a different way of summing up the ontologic argument in terms of two premises and a conclusion. We've seen this kind of form in the course a couple times already. Premise one or assumption one, premise two or assumption two. Therefore, you can read that black line as therefore conclusion. Thus, therefore, God exists. So look at this and ignore, ignore this stuff for now. God either exists or does not exist. Okay, this is a, an excellent starting assumption. <laughs> you you want to start your argument with assumptions that your audience will share. If, if um, you know, you want to draw your audience into the logic of your argument. You want to take them from premises we all accept into a conclusion maybe that your audience didn't realize they should accept. And it's hard to get a premise that's more um, um, indisputable than this. This premise just has the following form, or you can put it like this if you want. But the, the logic of it is, is clear here. In premise one, we're just saying A or not A. A or not A. A is um, A is God exists, right? That's the A. And not A is the does not exist. So A A stands for God exists, right? God. Sorry, I'm writing with my mouse here. I'll just G E. A equals God exists. Not A means it's it's not that God exists, or it's not the case that God exists. Okay, so premise one is 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 this complex compound statement of the form A or not A, and it's true because there's there's no other option. It's true because um, these two options are exhaustive; they cover all the possible options. Um, so, so far so good, true. Premise two is that a non-existent God is an inconsistent idea, right? And there's a lot more going on here and we've just spent some time unpacking that. This is um, dependent on if we ask, well, why do you think premise two is true? We'll have to talk about the ontologic principle we just talked about. Um, so. But, but if, if you can accept the ontologic principle and then you accept premise two, then you're taken to the conclusion by, by logical necessity, I think it's correct, that, that God exists, right? Because God either exists or doesn't, A or not A. And then we're told here, look at the double negative, not not A. You can just kind of see mathematically that, that. So A or not A, not not A. So by process of elimination, that leaves us with A. Over here, we have this the, the same argument, just represented in a slightly different way formally, but it's really, really, I think, better to pay attention to this one. Um, okay, so that's that's another way of representing the ontologic argument. And as usual, we want to start thinking critically. And the most famous objection to Anselm, and, and among the very first objections historically raised to Anselm, um, comes from a contemporary of his, a, a, another, a fellow monk, Anselm was a, a monk in the Catholic tradition, and a fellow monk named Guanilo offered the uh, analogy of a perfect island, which you conceive of, this is an island which is the greatest possible island, the greatest possible paradise, I guess. 
And Guanalo says, well, if we just follow the logic of Anselm's argument, we're led to the conclusion that this island necessarily exists, this perfect island. And according to Guanalo, that's absurd. Maybe the island exists, maybe it doesn't, but there's no way you can, you have the right to conclude that the perfect island exists just from defining the perfect island. So Guanalo's argument, it, it's, it's, it's in a way a very curious, um, inconclusive kind of objection. Guanalo's just saying, kind of making fun of Anselm, just performing this parody. It's a parody of Anselm's argument saying, well, I can do what you did too, Anselm, but instead of God, I'll talk about a perfect island. And look, ta-da, at the end of my argument, I end up with the conclusion that the perfect island necessarily exists. And he, Guanalo assumes that his audience will laugh and realize that there's no way you have, you can conclude that a perfect island exists just by thinking about it. So there must be something wrong with that kind of argument. Guanalo is saying, your kind of argument, Anselm, lets one conclude the perfect anything, the perfect pencil, the perfect whatever. All right, fall, if you accept the ontologic principle, you're led to absurdity. And so we should reject the ontologic principle or reject something else in the argument. So this is Guanalo's perfect island objection. And I think Anselm would have a pretty good response to it. On behalf of Anselm, anyway, we can say the following. What do you mean by perfect island? And Guanalo would say, well, it's an island than which none greater is possible. And then we could really push, push Guanalo. We could say, well, what do you mean none greater is possible? Do you mean it just has an infinite supply of coconuts and a perfectly temperate environment and and water that's just the right toe test temperature to go for your daily swim what, what do you mean by perfect island i mean at some point you're going to get bored with eating coconuts and going for swims won't you want uh, a hollow deck like on the starship enterprise where you can summon anything into virtual existence and be anything and eat anything and do anything and summon any environment well, how would that island be any different from heaven? In fact, how would heaven be any different from God itself? Heaven is just the expression of God's perfection we share in, right? If you're, if you're on an island which can summon anything for you and manifest anything for you and allow you to become anything, you're really living in God's mind and sharing in God's power. I mean, and so the perfect island actually becomes equivalent with a being. I mean, notice that the perfect island would also be one that could not be invaded, could not um, be corrupted, could not come apart after a hundred years, could not um, suffer the ravages of rising waters in the era of uh, climate change and so on. So, well, what, what, what would protect the island from all these contingencies? Well, omnipotence. <laughs> this island would have to be the most powerful thing in existence, the most powerful thing possible. So this, if, if you really push the idea of perfect in perfect island or perfect pencil, the perfect pencil would be one by which I can commit to paper all truths and through which I can commit to paper a blueprint for the ultimate reality for the perfect universe. Well, I guess that pencil is God then too, or God's mind in action and so on. So, so we can, <laughs> Guanalo thinks he's, he's conducting a parody of, of, um, the argument, but maybe he's just doing something a little tighter than a parody. He's doing just a close copying of it using different words and hasn't thought carefully about perfect. I mean, Anselm's point is that God is a very special character and the concept of God just means the sum of perfection. And if anything which is perfect will be God, if you really push it. So that's Guanilo's objection, and that's a response, at least on behalf of Anselm, to Guanilo. And as with the 
pragmatic argument, you should think further about um, about objections. Uh, in the von Inwagen chapter from CPR, there 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 are there's a whole history of the ontologic argument. He takes it right into the 20th century into um, Plantinga's version and uh, and uh, looks at some of the other famous historical criticisms of Anselm, prime among which is is Immanuel Kant's objection. So you might want to get to know Kant's objections if you're interested in the argument. Kant. Well, we're going to go off list now. Buckle up. We're done our, our um, arguments um, for God's existence or something in that neighborhood. And we'll finish up this second unit of the course on the defense of theism by um, looking at a fairly recent argument from a guy named Alvin Plantinga, which is meant to show that um, naturalist atheism is in logical trouble. So this is, um, I mean, you know, the old adage that the best defense is a good offense. Um, I suppose you can see that in Anselm. Anselm is sort of defending belief in God by showing that the atheist is being irrational. I mean, this goes back to what Paul said too about those who doubt God's existence when they look at the starry night sky. Um, the defense of, of theism or belief in God is often an implicit or explicit attack on the counterposition of atheism. We'll hear um, Plantinga, Alvin Plantinga, in this um, fairly influential argument, tries to show that a worldview with no God runs into a kind of a kind of inconsistency, not 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 explicit logical contradiction of the kind we saw Anselm accusing atheists of, but but um, a kind of similar strategy. Okay, what is this we're looking at? Well, this is a Google image steampunk contraption of some kind, but I, I've taken it as a nice uh, picture of planting as example of an alien radio, and it represents atheism before the arrival of Darwin. So before Darwin, atheists, who were, I think, mostly in the closet, did not have a very good explanation of human nature and the human mind. Right? I mean, if you believe in God, then you can say we were made in God's image, or God, who's super, super smart, made people who are kind of smart. But if you don't um, if you don't have the advantage of that theistic explanation, and you don't yet have Darwin and the uh, lever of natural selection to explain, you know, the mind, the animal mind, and certainly the human mind as a sort of special example of that, it's, it's like the human mind is this alien radio. <clears throat> Plantinga asks you to imagine you've just uh, stepped down from your spacecraft. You've landed on what seems to be an... Uh, uninhabited planet far from home. And you walk, you walk, you walk, you walk, and then you encounter this. It's a little like Paley's watch. But this thing talks. It, it, it's not really in conversation with you, but it, it's outputting these messages interspersed with little beeps. And it seems to be stating facts. And these are facts which you have no way of confirming or disconfirming. It says things like, the first homo sapien to cross the Bering Strait was left-handed. Beep. On the morning he was defeated at Waterloo, Napoleon Bonaparte had rye toast with eggs over easy. Beep. And so on and so forth. Right, so these are um, statements which you have no way right now of independently checking. And even if you had access to the World Wide Web um, through your uh, 
touch sensitive wristwatch on the outside of your space suit, uh, you, you couldn't find the answers to these, uh, couldn't find confirmation of these facts. These are just things we have no way of figuring out. Assumedly, things we will never know unless we had access to some kind of time machine. Uh, well, imagine that you're just so impressed by the confidence with which this alien radio makes its assertions and, and by the context within which you meet it. You go back to your spaceship, you've taken pictures, and you've made notes on everything it said, and you're very excited to go back to Earth and now share with Earth, come down from the mountain and share with Earth the um, facts, the facts and interesting factoids you've learned from the alien radio. But hopefully at some point, Plantinga uh, says, you'll scratch your helmet on the ride back to Earth and say, wait a sec, why do I believe anything that that thing said? I have no idea who made it, why it's there, what its motivations are. I have no idea of, um, you know, its history of truth telling. I can't judge whether it's a reliable narrator of, of the world. And so I really have no way of knowing whether anything it said is true. I have no reason to have confidence in it. The alien radio is your own mind <laughs> in a much more complicated way with many, many more steps. And by taking in perceptual data from the holes in your head, your eyes and ears and nose and so on, you end up outputting statements which you sort of speak to yourself and usually speak to others. You, you, you take in information and then your mind, your whole nervous system, extended into your social connections, eventually outputs uh, assertions. And those assertions compose what we call your worldview. Your view of what's going on, your map of reality is somewhat reducible to a series of logically linked assertions. And it's, it's your mind, your mind machine, again, in conjunction with the broader social um, connections, all the other minds you've been interacting with, that that has output these assertions. And before Darwin, and without belief that your mind was made by a benign, truthful, fatherly creator, you, you really have no reason to trust what your mind is outputting. Like the alien radio, you don't know who made it and why it was made, right? So this is all just a background or setup for planting his argument. We haven't quite got to his argument yet, but he's just pointing out that atheism before Darwin was in a kind of trouble or it had this one thing um, that it couldn't explain. Now you might say, well, it, it refrained, for, atheism refrained from explaining the human mind before we had a Darwinian explanation, and it, it refrained from explaining for good reason, it, for lack of evidence. And, and the, uh, the religionists who back in 1620 were very confident that our mind was bequeathed to us by, um, by God, I mean, they believed that for the most part without justification. So it's not like they had a justified true belief, all of them, of, of our mind being created by God. But notice that the atheist before Darwin is in the strange position now of, I mean, if they think through the implications of their worldview, they'll, they'll see, hopefully, that they no longer have any reason to trust their own mind or the mind's of others, right? Now, how does atheism do after Darwin? That's the focus of Plantinga's argument. Planting is going to show us that in a way after Darwin, it becomes worse for atheists because before Darwin, you, you could just, I guess, shrug your shoulders and say, well, I don't know how the mind happened or why it was made. Um, and so I, I'm kind of in the dark about whether to trust it or not. After Darwin, says Plantinga, 
you you as a naturalist as a darwinian acquire some reasons to be quite skeptical of your mind to actually actively mistrust it to suspect that actually your mind i mean you have after darwin you have an explanation of why your mind was made or how it was made and that explanation actually uh would seem to make the mind unreliable as a truth-telling machine and uh call this darwin's doubt planting his argument is is new but he finds seeds of it in this letter of darwin to i think a friend william graham back in 1881 this would have been a couple decades after darwin had published his first major work outlining the theory of evolution but then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind you see the idea here being that given the story evolution tells us of the origins of our mind now we can start to doubt along with darwin whether we should trust our mind so i've been using the term atheism i think i used the term naturalism a few minutes ago too naturalism is 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 scientifically informed atheism it's i, I think most contemporary self-identified atheists i mean notice that atheism is a negative term it's just it's just saying what you're not the a is the negation and the theism is the belief in god an atheist is just saying i don't believe in god or i believe that god does not exist if you if you ask the contemporary atheist well what do you believe in um nine times out of ten i think their worldview will be something in the neighborhood of what's sometimes called naturalism i mean this is the belief that the natural sciences basically give us something approaching a correct picture of reality and this naturalist view has supplanted the theistic view um, and so evolutionary naturalism is simply naturalism after darwin it's naturalism that accepts darwin as most naturalists would and we'll we'll use uh, evolutionary theory quite extensively as it turns out to explain questions about human nature right i mean the question is um you know, how did we get to be so smart the naturalist will very quickly resort to darwinian explanation so it's the belief there's no god and that quite specifically humans uh, all life is uh, are the product of evolution okay so this is the, this is the target of plantinga's argument and it's certainly culturally this is the uh, i think it's the dominant intellectual paradigm of our time certainly in the educated world something like evolutionary naturalism is uh you know it's 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 it um it's the dominant ideology and uh plantinga's you know taking it on <laughs> on behalf of the uh, marginalized christians of american academia plantinga contra evolutionary naturalism cage match okay so here's here's plantinga's conclusion we'll see how he gets to it we're already i think you're already getting a sense of how he's going to get there but uh, but his conclusion is that evolutionary naturalism is self-defeating and this notion of self-defeat is quite 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 close to the notion of self-contradiction we witnessed in in anselm's argument so take any belief called belief b it could be a belief like it is raining right now or humans cannot know anything that's a belief belief b is self-defeating if the belief implies that b itself should not be believed so it's look when you when you believe that humans cannot know anything and you're a human the implication of your belief is that you can't know anything and the implication of that belief is that you can't know this right so if you believe this you're in a kind of 
logical instability where the implications of this belief come back to bite the belief and cancel it. This one's uh, much more debatable, uh, you know, interminably debatable perhaps, but um, think for a moment about how this belief that murderers deserve the death penalty could imply a self-contradiction. Now, uh, you can pause the pause the narration here if you want and think about it for a minute. I'll, I'll uh, work it out for you now. It's, it's that, depending on how you define murder, I guess you could, you could argue that the state who executes a murderer is also performing murder. Now, the state's execution might be a justified kind of murder, but it is homicide. Homicide just means killing a man, killing a human. Um, so if you believe that murderers deserve the death penalty, well, I guess that's not strictly logically self-defeating. It just in practice would lead to a collapse of the whole system because it followed through. Uh, let's say Joe uh, has murdered somebody and then the state executes Joe. Now, the executioner ought to, by this statement, be executed. Okay, so Joe's executioner is now strapped in the chair and Jane flips the switch to send the surge of electricity into Joe's body. Okay, thank you for your good work, Jane. Now you take your seat in the, in the chair and it's her turn and um, we'll just go one by one through the entire human population till everybody's dead and the whole thing collapses. So there's a kind of instability in this in this notion. Of course, there's, a, I mean, if someone points this out to you, if you're the one who pointed this out, then you gotta you gotta go back and tidy up your language. Maybe maybe you gotta say, well, not murderers in general, but um, murderers who murder without moral justification or something. Then you need to write a legal essay or textbook on what constitutes justified homicide as opposed to unjustified homicide, uh, right? Here's another distinction important for Plantinga's argument. We're going to get all the pieces in place and then put them together very quickly. Um, notice the difference between useful beliefs and true beliefs. I think we ordinarily think that true beliefs will be useful and more useful than false beliefs. But in principle, you can separate the two uh, characteristics of belief. And in practice, we can think of examples where actually the false belief is more useful than the true belief. We'll see some examples shortly, some of them from the evolutionary account. And um, if nature has been sort of pushing the development of our nervous system and our brain in the direction of acquiring a useful picture of the world. So nature wants us to have a useful map of our environment, one which will help us survive and reproduce. And the question of whether that ma map is strictly true of our environment is secondary, it's secondary. Uh, by the evolutionary account, nature's not really at all directly interested in whether you have true beliefs. Nature wants you to have useful beliefs. Now, often the two will converge. Often, often the, the most useful map of your environment will be the accurate one, but not always. And because evolution is so focused on developing functional adaptations, functional uh, features of the organism, uh, truth, which is maybe a much more late cultural philosophical obsession, um, is not going to be reliably produced by any mind that was created by natural selection. So the fact that my behavior or that of my ancestors has been adaptive is at best a third rate reason for thinking my beliefs mostly true and my cognitive faculties reliable. By cognitive faculties, we simply mean all the parts of you that get you to intake information from the world and collate it and output it into a 
and picture of reality. It's your brain, it's your nervous system, it's your perceptual organs and all the mental modules that work in conjunction. Um, it's not something you can point to with a single arrow on an anatomy diagram, but um, the question of whether it's reliable or not is simply the question of whether it's prone to pollute, produce true beliefs over false beliefs. So a reliable cognitive mechanism is one which tends to output true beliefs. An unreliable cognitive mechanism is one which um, doesn't have a good record of, of producing truth. We can debate where the threshold should be, whether it's at 50% truth or 90% truth, but uh, anyway, this notion of reliability is really central. Planting is arguing that according to the evolutionary account of, of the human mind, the human mind is not a reliable mechanism. It can't be counted on to output truth. And that's the instability in the modern atheist view. So here's Plantinga's main argument in terms of premises and conclusions. Instead of reading through this uh, with you, I'll just, you know, if you want, you can pause the presentation here and read it through and unpack it a little bit a little bit of homework for you maybe. Um, but um, this sort of summarizes um, planting his argument. Here's the conclusion. If evolutionary naturalism is true, then we have insufficient reason to trust our beliefs, including our belief in evolutionary, in evolutionary naturalism. So if you're the modern atheist and you think our mind was output by natural selection, you, you actually believe your mind is unreliable. So you actually have no reason to trust your belief in evolutionary naturalism. That's the snake bending back to bite its own tail now. Right? Or that's the atheist position self-collapsing by its um, contradictory implications. Plantinga says that... Um, probability that your mind is reliable given naturalism and evolution right? or on the assumption of evolutionary naturalism the probability that your mind is reliable is low or inscrutable the probability that your mind is reliable is low or we just can't tell whether your mind is reliable or not And so you, the atheist, are now in trouble. All right, here's some examples, just a list, one, two, three, four, five, of facts or theories which, which fill out Plantinga's worry about naturalism. So first of all, Plantinga's own example and this is very hypothetical. Plantinga asks us to imagine in the ancient evolutionary environment back in you know, the African savanna or wherever, um, our ancestors, and imagine two tribes, okay, tribe A and tribe B, and they live in close proximity and they're very similar in all respects, except for one. Uh, tribe A has the correct belief about saber-toothed tigers. Tribe A correctly believes that saber-toothed tigers like to eat other mammals and would like to eat a member of tribe A if they could get their saber teeth on them. And so when a member of tribe A sees a saber-toothed tiger, they turn on their heels and run. So their action is in response to their correct belief that the tiger will eat them and their desire to not be eaten. Tribe B also turns and runs when they see a saber-toothed tiger, but they do it for a very different reason. They have the incorrect belief that saber-toothed tigers are their eternal friend and that saber-toothed tigers and tribe B are in an eternal game of ta tag and maybe in this round of, of the cosmos, the cosmic cycle. Um, tigers are it. 
tigers are doing the chasing. And so humans, out of love of the tigers and the love of this proposed relation, uh, run with all of their energy, with a kind of religious zeal whenever they um, encounter a tiger. And you can imagine, I mean, this is very hypothetical and, and it's just meant to make clear the distinction between useful and true beliefs. Plantinga asks us to imagine that the members of Tribe B are so enthusiastic about this game of chase that they their success rate in evading um, tiger attack is equal to the success rate of the members of Tribe A who actually fear these tigers. So this would be a case where you've got a false belief which is just as effective as the true belief in getting the business of life done, which is not being eaten in this case. So that's just in principle. That's just an in principle um, scenario to help you understand this distinction between useful and true beliefs. But then in, in reality, in, evolution, in, in our actual evolutionary history, we can see all sorts of ways in which truth has been secondary. And the truth, the true map is not what we're receiving. And, and we're receiving actually distorted uh, or so narrowly constrained picture of the world as to be a distortion for practical purposes. Notice how selective our perception is. And by selective perception, I don't just mean that, you know, in the room you're in right now, there are lots of things you're not noticing because you're focused on um, your computer screen. I mean, your, your very sense faculties have long ago been designed to pick up only a certain range of frequencies in your environment, right? A certain range of the, uh, the, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum through your eyes, a certain range of oscillations of, your, of the air around you uh, through your ears, right? Tw 20 cycles per second, 20 hertz up to about around 20,000 hertz. That's, I mean, rats apparently can hear up to 90, 90,000 hertz. Uh, so, um, we've been constrained by evolution from seeing the full environment around us. Why? Because evolution just wants you to focus on what's useful to you and what's useful to you is what helps you survive, notice predators, notice potential mates and reproduce. Related point is, has to do with the arbitrariness of color and taste perception. Very, it's very apparent with color and taste perception that your psychology is overlaying something on the world that isn't there. Um, you know, in, in what sense is the apple itself red? Right, the redness of your visual perception, that's not in the apple skin itself. The apple skin has a certain micro texture, like at the I guess, uh, I mean, super micro at almost the atomic level, which influences how the light bounces off of it and hits your eye. And then the way your eye interprets that surface, how it interprets it is by coding it or highlighting it in this color we call red. The highlights, your perception of the world is, is colored or highlighted by your own psych psychological mechanism, which is another inheritance of of evolution and it's very clear in the case of taste that there's a there's a practical function to this the sugar the apple is is not itself sweet the apple has sugar molecules but it's not the sweetness is not in the apple the sweetness is in your tongue so to speak or your whole your tongue and the whole uh, mental system that that gives you that sense, pleasing sensation of sweetness when you bite into the apple. And clearly in this case, nature has highlighted your experience of the apple to get you to finish that apple and seek out more apples. And it, nature has made um, rotting corpses and feces, uh, sorry, um, taste awful, vomitously awful to you because um, nature very much wants you to avoid eating that stuff as tempted as you may be. It's, I mean, a kind of a disturbing thought is that anything that tastes bad to you is something in, at your deepest level you're tempted to eat, right? And that includes feces and corpses. 
nature has, slaps us on the hand when we try to eat those things by making them taste horrible uh, because at some point we were tempted to eat them and it made us sick. I mean, that's obviously a little bit simplistic, but, but the point is that nature is radically coloring and therefore distorting your picture of the world just to get you to do the things that are good for you and avoid the things that are bad for you. So again, nature wants you to have useful beliefs, a useful picture, not necessarily a true picture. So these are little indications that, yeah, all along we've, we are, our, our cognitive faculties, which include perception, have been shaped by this adaptive function, right? And philosophy or the love of truth, <laughs> truth for its own sake, maybe, is a very late achievement in animal history. Um, it's something a very small percentage of um, this one monkey called Homo sapiens um, obsess over. And I mean, even most philosophers and scientists aren't interested in truth for its own sake. They're interested in truth for the sake of writing an interesting essay that their colleagues will read and applaud them for, or interested in truth for the sake of um, getting more funding for their next research project and so on, or interested in truth for the sake of improving the conditions of the oppressed or whatever, if they're in sociology and want to get true data. The truth is not for its own sake, it's for the sake of helping, which is noble, but it's not... <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just the same thing we've been doing all along through animal history, which is um, perceiving the world in a very interested way. Uh, a little more, getting more into the um, conjectural realm, I suppose. I mean, I don't know the details in the current state of the art in evolutionary psychology, but uh, Jeffrey Miller, ooh, I think this goes back to his graduate thesis in the 1990s, but he, he posits what we can call the entertaining brain hypothesis. And if you want to read more about it, check out A Mating Mind, his, his book, which is, oh, I think around 15 years old now. Miller's view is that if you start with the question of why humans are so talented and so smart, and we are, it's a fascinating question. Uh, how did we get to be so smart so quick? It seems like it happened over the last couple million years that our uh, brain sizes, or at least our skull volume, doubled or tripled somewhere in that neighborhood. And the question which all evolutionary psychologists should be interested in is how did this happen? And M Miller's view is that our big brain is kind of like the peacock's big tail. One of its main functions is attracting and retaining mates, that we're using our brains to entertain each other, to compose songs for each other, and to chat each other up in singles bars and on singles apps. And um, a lot of cultural production is not oriented towards just drawing an accurate, you know, train schedule of reality. It's, it's in, um, distorting reality in pleasing ways, telling stories, narrating our life to each other in a pleasing way, which often deviates from the strict truth for the sake of impressing each other. And our brain, of course, is involved in all sorts of activities like dance. I mean, to dance effectively, to perform this mating ritual effectively, you have to have a very well-functioning brain. In the entertaining brain hypothesis, what you're doing when you're dancing <laughs> is displaying your healthy brain for the people watching you. Um, Anyway, this is this is the thesis of a mating mind. And so our brain is more like Hollywood than, um, you know, NASA or um, or Columbia University. And very speculatively, Don Hoffman's adaptive non-realism. Um, I mean, his view is just it's it's just a radical extension of this kind of thinking we've been looking at through this list that truth seekers have been deselected from natural history and people who have the right kind of false picture of reality have been selected 
and at this point in natural history in the in the natural development of the mind um we have a radically false view of what reality is we're very far from reality between us and reality there's this whole there's these layers of practical modulation and illusion I mean, this is adaptive non-realism that we have a non-realistic view of reality um, that what we th think of as reality is just so far from it and it's 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 far from it for adaptive reasons but uh, if, if you're curious to see how how far this position can be taken uh, check out dan hoffman um, i think you can find him discussing it on a couple of popular podcasts online but uh, Here we go. I forgot what my next slide was. It's an excerpt from the podcast where I heard him chat. This is from the After On podcast, which I haven't followed for a year or so, but uh, there's some great episodes there. And one of them uh, interviews Dan Hoffman, Don Hoffman. And here's the host, Reed, asking Hoffman, so a species which sees reality in a pristinely accurate way competes with a rival species that throws away most or even all of reality for more, more agile metaphor. The latter species will win every time. Is that correct? That's right. When evolution by natural selection is shaping our perceptions, the selection forces are uniformly against anything at all like the truth. Here are a couple of objections to Plantinga's position to get to get you started thinking critically. So first of all, the web of belief makes adaptive falsehoods unlike an adaptive falsehood is a false belief which is useful. But because our beliefs are all interconnected and one false belief has implications for all the beliefs it's logically connected to. Um, the false beliefs tend to get ironed out as anomalies. So you might get away if you're tribe B, you might, you might think you can get away with this very strange belief that tigers are your friend. Though actually the, you know, the belief, um, it sounds so hypothetical, but it reminds me of some Aboriginal, I mean, North American Aboriginal views about the relations between even prey predator species. I mean, I think the, um, the people of the deer very locally have a, a not all that different view about their relationship with the deer whom they they hunt but they believe that the people of the deer and the deer are in this kind of archetypal or eternal relationship and that there's been some kind of deep consent between the hunter and the hunted from outside of time um so it, and if, if that if that view is uh is it all representative and it's not anomalous among indigenous views about about local f fauna then maybe that that seemingly highly speculative tri tribe b of our ancestry was actually where we all came from or a lot of us came from anyway why tigers in particular i mean um you also know that tigers have big predatorial teeth and big predatorial claws, and they're quite similar physiognomically to all kinds of other predators you see munching up animals. And you don't assume a beautiful game of tag is taking place in those, in those cases. So your belief that the tiger isn't really a predator doesn't fit well with your other beliefs, your observations about its very predatorial uh, machinery, its teeth and claws, right? So your belief that the tigers aren't really predators now really sticks out. It's like pulsing red in your web of beliefs as an anomaly, which needs to be accounted for. And to iron it out, you either got to take on a belief that all these predators are actually not predators, or you've got to rethink this view that the tigers are your, are your friends. So because of the interconnection of beliefs, beliefs that are false it's like reality is 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 actually it demands consistency from people who will navigate it for any length of time if you're going to be in reality moving around and surviving reality is going to force your mind to get right with it and false beliefs will be will be deselected uh 
so something to think about for sure. This is, you know, from an, so from an evolutionary perspective, you might say it's actually likely you're going to have largely correct beliefs, or you're going to have a, a fairly reliable cognitive faculty. Okay. Here's a, an, another objection, which I, I believe comes to us from Ernst Sosa, an American uh, you know, philosopher. And this genetic fallacy, I encourage you to Google it and look it up and maybe read about some other common logical fallacies. The genetic fallacy, by the way, this doesn't have specifically to do with DNA. This term genetic fallacy is probably older than Darwin and the discovery of DNA much more recently. The genetic fallacy is simply the logical mistake of making too big a deal over where a belief comes from and paying too little attention to just the quality of the belief itself. And we commit something like the genetic fallacy in all sorts of um, twisted worldviews. I mean, in very simplistic racism, you, you judge an individual simply because of where they come from, right? either literally their place of origin or the sort of racially where they're coming from. And instead of just judging the, the person for their own actual lived qualities, and we can do this to beliefs too. We can harshly judge a belief or a belief system or a cognitive faculty in this case because of where it came from instead of just looking at the faculty itself. So when Plantinga says, well, uh, you know, I judge the human cognitive faculty harshly because of where it came from, where did it come from? It came from the process of evolution over millions of years. Sosa says, be careful. I mean, just because it came from that doesn't mean it's unreliable. And, um, a nice analogy here is ima imagine you're uh, you've just left your home in a rush. You've got to get to campus to write a uh, calculus exam, and uh, you realize ten minutes out out the door that you left your calculator at home, and and you know you need your calculator for the exam, and. You got to catch that train though you're running and you see that an, someone uh, has left out on their front lawn near the sidewalk a box of old knickknacks books and old cds and uh you know sega genesis controller and there in in the box you see gleaming <laughs> your savior it's a, it's it's a dusty looking scientific calculator and you grab it and you dust off the uh, the solar cells and you push on and, and miraculously it comes on. It's a little bit flickery, but it seems to be working. It's pretty grimy and it's a little bit cracked. The screen is cracked, but it seems to be working. Anyway, it's your best bet. You take it in, you, you write the exam using this calculator. And, uh, and when you get the exam back, you check your answers again. And it turns out the calculator was working fine and you continue to use it. Uh, with a little bit of caution at first and, and cross-checking it with other calculators, but eventually you realize, hey, it's a little bit cosmetically damaged, but this calculator works fine. So the origin of the calculator was dubious in this, you know, box of trash. But in the end, you judge it for how it performs and it performs accurately. It turns out to be reliable. Well, our mind came from the trash heap of history, maybe, but it maybe turns out to be reliable. The problem, the problem here, I mean, we can, we can come back at so, so on behalf of planting and say, yeah, but how do you cross check your mind? You, you the only way you could cross check your mind is by comparing it with other minds. <laughs> and the, the problem according to planting is all these minds are now in question because they've all emerged from, from natural history. <laughs>